I did forget to mention that when we mow off a crop and there is weed seeds in the crop, we actually remove that material off the field. Uh, so we love grinding up weeds that aren't in flower or seed, and we will certainly grind up crop residues. Uh, but if there is seed heads present, we will either manually remove them with knives or machetes, if there's just a few of them, and toss them off into separate piles on the edge of the field, uh, essentially compost piles of a rough nature that that material will be used in the uh, perennial areas where uh, annual weeds don't matter. Or uh, we will mow those materials off by undercutting them with a sickle bar mower or with a scythe or a machete to undercut the material and then rake the, that residue off and deposit it off field in those piles. Uh, so sometimes we do remove crop residue, or if there is uh, some of the, some of the uh, trellising, the twines and things from trellising are unmowable. So we'll, we'll machete something off or something and, and heap that into the composting situation. The, the tomato uh, uh, twine and trellises and the tomato plants, we'll just chop them off with machetes, roll them all up and pitch them into the regular composting system. So, uh, now, I was asked if we remove diseased crop residue or if we just grind that right in. We just grind in any kind of diseased crop residue because uh, basically uh, what we, we, we think is going on is that the, the crop did not become diseased because there was disease inoculum present. The crop became diseased because it was of uh, grown in a condition that was prone to disease. And that when we repeat the next procedure and, or next crop in that place, uh, hopefully we have altered the soil and environmental conditions so that the crop is not prone to diseases. Uh, if, you know, I'm not a big believer in inoculum. In, uh, like I said, if there was, uh, no late blight for a hundred miles around, you know, maybe you should be cautious about bringing an inoculum into your farm. But if, if the disease organism is present in your environment, it doesn't matter if you remove all the disease residue. If you, it, it would be a waste of time because if you just repeat the same thing and the, the, it's a common disease in your area, the crop is just going to be reinfected. It doesn't matter if you removed the inoculum. So uh, in general, we try to improve the soil conditions primarily. And then there was the crop rotation discussion, which uh, do we rotate our crops? And there is a, a crop rotation chart that we'll get to in your, in your, in your handout there, which kind of shows the intensity of crop rotation and how one crop goes right into another year round. Uh, and we do rotate plant families to some degree. In fact, primarily, we do still move the plant families around the farm in a crop rotation sequence. But no longer do we find that that is necessary to avoid diseases. And certainly, we have seen where one crop you can plant right on top of the, the, the crop that just came out being exactly the same. And we have very good results growing the same crop right on top of uh, where the previous crop had grown. Uh, so there is this concept that if the soil grew an excellent crop and there was no diseases, insects to any great extent anyway, that the soil has adjusted, the soil biology has adjusted to growing that crop very effectively. So to grow the same crop in the same place, the soil is all ready to go. It, it's going to love that. And if you think about it, that's what nature does. Nature will keep reseeding. Uh, at the same, even the annual, in the same place over and over again. So, which is not to say if there's a problem uh, in disease or insects, which, you know, we still run into some occasional disease or insect problems, you know, crop rotation can be a handy thing to move away from that area. Particularly for us, because our three fields are actually separated from each other by a mile or more. And so, uh, you know, when we rotate, we can really move 
you know, something away from insects or diseases or that kind of thing. So a physical separation in a crop rotation can still be very handy, but what we've found is that as time goes on, it is certainly less necessary and, and potentially not, potentially uh, of benefit not to rotate. I will talk about the specifics of the crop rotation chart in uh, a, a few minutes after we get through the no-till uh, section of the talk. So I left off with seeding. And so here we have the uh, a simple example uh, of, of starting to seed. Just some of the various tools. This was an attempt to kind of capture uh, a different scenario. I get some better pictures coming up in a second, but we'll just talk about this one for a second. Uh, basically, the top bed below those parsnips is just solarized. The bed in the middle was solarized and shows some type of salad green just germinating, essentially with no weeds in it, even though it's difficult to tell right there. And the bed that I am working on right there, standing on, uh, is just composted and seed is being worked into that bed surface with a, a rolling cultivator in that, in that uh, frame there. So basically, basically we work barefoot. You know, we do a lot of barefoot uh, effort and uh, that is very helpful because it's light, light, and we can work more and get more done. But, uh, and kind of like suck up some nutrients through our feet, you know. <laughs> but uh, let's see what we got next. I think that I have better pictures coming up in the next seed sequence. So here is dragging the seeds in, and this is, I'm gonna run through this again in the next seed sequence. This is dragging seeds in using a ring drag, uh, and then we're gonna mulch over the soil surface. There's a compost, bu or a five gallon bucket there uh, for distributing some IMO inoculant. And then the bed is mulched over and immediately the seed is watered in. And in general, under our soil conditions, this is the only irrigation that ever happens on a crop. If, if things really get dry, we still have the option of irrigating. But in general, uh, we only water to start a seed germinating or to water in a transplant that just got set in the field. Just the one time, unless it's something like carrot uh, or a real slow germinating crop, direct seeded, uh, then we'll come back at least one more time after a couple days or something. Uh, the, the, the procedure of compost below, seed, and then mulch uh, is very good at retaining moisture for seedling germination. So that is part of the reason why it's successful. Uh, you can certainly mix nutrients into the water when you're, when you're watering something in as well, like seaweed is a great germination uh, 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 of, of assistance for seedling germination. Uh, however, or, or maybe a splash of hydrated lime, but uh, in general, we just run straight water by and large. Some seawater mixed in would be a great addition too. But you know, if you got a little time, you know, there's this concept that anytime you're watering, it's pretty easy to just add a little extra uh, nutrient as long as you're already putting the effort into watering something. So there's some ideas there, but I, there's a better seed sequence here. Oh, this is uh, germination, I believe, of that bed. How thick are you putting that straw? Yeah, let's talk about that. You wouldn't want to keep it. Let me talk about that in a second with this next seed sequence. This is just showing germination through the mulch layer with the lack of weed growth. That's what those pictures are about. But this is another seed sequence on the 58-inch beds. So I'm going to answer your mulch question uh, with this seed sequence. So here we have a 58 inch bed that has been composted. Uh, in this case, we pull a, a, a pickup truck with a dump body on it, and we uh, use those refuse hooks to steadily uh, compost the bed surface. And then we rake the compost out over the bed surface. So you can see that this is relatively rough. You know, you can see that the rye has been raked aside off those two beds. Uh, and now uh, the compost 
truck has come through. We laid down compost on both beds with one truck. Uh, you can see that the compost does not cover really the whole soil. I mean, you can still see the rye residue and soil. So, you know, it covers mostly covers over the soil surface, but it's not a blanket of compost. And okay, so then in this case, we are seeding radish into this bed, which is, you know, very easy. It's an easy crop. But uh, in this case, I tried uh, using this seed, had a seed coating on it that made it white, it some kind of kaolin clay or something. Uh, so this, that's, so when we seed something, we'll write the date and how much volume per area. So all the seed for broadcast seeding is laid down at volume per area. A half a fluid ounce, that's not a half ounce of weight, and you have a whole chart in your handout on uh, volumes of seed to a given area. And it's all based on uh, 10 feet of bed length. So for this bed is 150 feet long at a half ounce per 10 feet would require seven and a half fluid ounces of radish seed to seed the 150 foot bed. And so here I have a fluid ounce in that cup, which in this case it means I'm gonna seed uh, 20 feet of this bed surface. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down the bed and I'm going to scatter the seeds evenly by hand over the bed surface, half of it, and then come down the other side and do the other half. When I get a quarter of the way down one side, I'm gonna have one quarter of the seed used from my measuring cup. When I get halfway down the bed, I'm gonna have used half of the seed from my measuring cup. And so it's a steady progress of volume of seed per area. And let me talk about that a little more before we move on to covering the seed and then mulching. But volume of seed by area is a little bit, uh, there's variables involved, particularly seed size. So if a seed is small, you're gonna have more plants per area. So if you get a, a tiny beet seed versus a large beet seed, and you're seeding volume of seed per area, uh, and this happens particularly with beets, uh, you know, you're gonna end up with different plant populations. So though I have a chart there with all the seed rates and you know, you, you've gotta use some of your own judgment and there's other conditions that uh, will relate to how you adjust those volumes of seed per area. Is it really dry out? Is it the middle of summer and you're trying to seed lettuces? Uh, is it uh, you know, the middle of winter and you're trying to seed spinaches, you know, which are going to stay hydrated and germinate really readily. So, you know, there's environmental differences, there's seed size differences, but in general, the numbers that are on that chart are going to be very close to what you're going to, what you're going to probably see as a, a reasonable uh, plant population per area. So, once the seed is on the soil surface, and you know, we could have done this without applying compost, but basically, uh, rarely do we seed through a mulch layer. Something, some small fine seed, a salad green or something, uh, you might be able to scatter like a brassica salad green over a mulch layer and kind of hit the mulch with a rake or a drag and the seeds will work down into the mulch and germinate all right. But generally, if there's a lot of crop residue or mulch uh, and we want to seed just directly on the soil, we'll rake excess aside like we do with the rye in this patch and then seed onto the soil or onto the composted soil. But regardless, the seed goes down and then it's dragged. And this is our common drag. It's a bunch of grain drill ring drag uh, uh, they're, they're what goes behind a grain drill to uh, work the seeds in. And we just simply, they're like $3 a piece. And we just gang them together on a bar. And uh, that is how we churn the soil about to work the seeds into that compost soil mixture. We go one way, then we come back down the bed the other way. A 58 inch bed requires uh, going down uh, two sides. So that's our primary means 
of working seed into the soil. I'll have some pictures of some other uh, tools for working it in. But, oh, well, you know, I was hoping in this picture that you could actually see the white radish seed because it was big and white. And you can barely see them. So, but I was hoping it would show up really well when, so this is exactly the same area now dragged over. And so you see some of the materials been churned up, but the radish seeds have uh, disappeared. So they've been worked into the soil simply with the use of a ring drag. Okay, and then now that straw that was brought off to the edge of the field has been put back over the, the seed. And so the 58-inch bed, uh, were you here for the earlier segment when I yeah, talked about? Yeah, it's for the driving then? Yeah, it's for the tractor. Harvesting. Uh, harvesting, we do fine with 58-inch bed. It's all right to walk on the bed a little bit. You know, generally we walk in the wheel tracks, but if you got to step out on the bed or something, it's, the soils are so resilient that they can take some human traffic. You know, we don't, you know, we don't just stomp up and down the beds, but, you know, if you got to walk or step on a bed, it's not, not a problem. And so, but this is the radish crop that came in. I believe it's this bed here. Or no, maybe it's that bed there. No, I think it's that bed there. And uh, no weeding. We never weeded that. So that's just what the radishes came up. No weed control. We sent, basically all it is, we scatter seed on the ground, threw some mulch over them, and come back and harvest radishes. So uh, you can see the labor-saving uh, uh, effort there because the labor is only involved basically in getting the seed on the ground, making sure the fertility is there, and then harvesting the crop. Labor spent on weed control generally gets you nothing at all. Like labor spent on fertilizing the ground will result in more fertility in the future. It's, it's time well spent. Uh, time spent destroying weeds is, is really not of any net gain. Yeah, just a sore back. Uh, a couple questions? I just wanted to throw it out that I built that ring drag uh -huh. in the field of last year, and I used it, and it was too big for my small farm. If anybody would like to come and get it, to the front of the Oh, farm, great. Oh, we hand pull it. Yeah, I think I have a picture of that coming out. Not that we couldn't mount it to a tractor in a second. Uh, and, but uh, again, by the time I get a tractor out and put it on a field and hook up the implement, you know, the guy, we would have walked up and down that bed, so many beds before we got that all rigged up. And so it's just one of those things that, you know, if we were on 50 acres, you know, I would mechanize that kind of thing. But on small acreage, you know, it's hard to beat uh, human efficiency, really. Uh, so we, we, we're not shy on, on human effort for, for certain, you know. Uh, so uh, here are the various tools to work the seed and get seed to soil contact. And primarily we use a ring drag, which you certainly could make to any size you want. I mean, you can cut that down or make it wider or whatever you need to do, but uh, the uh, much simpler option, although maybe not quite as effective, but pretty darn good, is to take a leaf rake and just take some pliers and straighten all those tines so that they're not catching the, the soil or mulch material, and it just churns the, the soil about. It's a simple leaf rake. Obviously, it's not as wide, but uh, certainly very effective as well. Uh, the simplest version of that is a branch of like an evergreen or something, which, you know, I've used in a pinch. If I didn't have anything else, I forgot my tool or something in one of the other fields. Uh, and so those churn the soil about. Now, sometimes when we have a particularly large seed, like cilantro sometimes, uh, and we want to get better seed to soil contact than just the ring drag, we'll roll that rolling cultivator. Uh, just it's garden weasel. The rolling cultivator is a tractor mounted implement of similar nature. We'll run the rolling cultivator over the soil, which turns the soil about without actually moving the seed. Or uh, you know, a rake would tend to 
pull the seed and, and bunch the seed. So these are the general tools for getting the seed kind of churned into the soil without clumping it or moving it from where it's been, it's been laid down. If we wanted additional seed to soil contact, say we were under a dry period or uh, we use this for uh, very low growing crops like mosh, where we're gonna have to cut them really low, uh, we would roll the bed. The, so either hand pulled or uh, tractor mounted. Uh, you, the rolling definitely gets you really much improved seed to soil contact. However, it really, we really rarely, you know, in terms of germination, barely ever really see a difference. Under specific occasions, like I said, could be very handy. You know, if you're being challenged with germination or something, definitely keep the roller in mind, but generally has not proven to be necessary to go through the extra effort of putting the roller out there. So some things though, you wanna cut really low like mosh and there's this residue, you know, mulches and things like that. Then it's very handy. So it can just smash down any kind of inconsistencies where mulch might get in the way of the cutting knife getting really low. So uh, those are some of your options. Let me see what we got here. Okay, now I'm gonna get into running cedars down the mulch layer. So let me talk about that. I'm going to talk about the mulch materials in a second, but let me finish with seeding. I'm going to run through running actual seeders down, seeding equipment down instead of broadcast seeding. Okay, so uh, basically if you've got a high residue environment, uh, you can't push a seeder down through, you know, we've hand pushed seeders. Then obviously they make specialty no-till seeders that can deal in one pass with getting through a high residue environment and getting the seed in the ground. But we'll, we do a two-step procedure where we rip a furrow uh, either with the tractor or most of the time simply by hand, again, because by the time you get the tractor and you get all mounted and uh, you know, you're, you've already furrowed for half a mile you know, with a hoe. So uh, there was an earlier picture of a furrowing hoe. You know, there's hoes that are V-shaped or plow-shaped that are better, but you can certainly use the edge of a half-moon hoe or something like that too, just to pull and make a furrow right through the high residue environment with some kind of point. Here there's some uh, shovels mounted on the cultivator frame that are going to furrow for, this is a beat spacing. So, uh, this is gonna just provide me rips through that high residue environment. Then I'm gonna run the regular earthway seeder right down through the ripped furrow. And we do that for some of the large seeds, particularly which are hard to get churned into the soil enough, or for something like pole beans, what's large too, which needs a trellising system, or for sweet corn, we still grow in rows. Uh, so some of, the, some of the larger seeded crops will still, uh, run furrows and then uh, 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 run the cedar down them. But you know, the primary reason for growing crops really in rows is to be able to hoe them, to cultivate them. And when there is no weeds, you, you really lose that impetus to have to put things in rows. Plants are happier spaced out more evenly than down rows where they're kind of condensed and then they put canopies out so, uh, but yes, we still run some, some furrowing equipment. This one has got the plow, the V plow mounted, which isn't a great picture, but yeah, it's kind of got a little bit too much rust on it. It's been sitting outside. Uh, and so if we need a big furrow, like for the seed potato or something, uh, we'll run the, uh, 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 I guess it's a middle buster, is what it would be called, or a small furrowing plow mounted on the cultivating frame, which uh, throws out more soil than just a little uh, hoe or cultivation uh, point. However, here's an example of running the uh, pinpoint seeders, which, so in this case, I want to demonstrate uh, running pinpoint seeders for salad greens versus broadcast seeding. And so this is the same thing we could still uh, in this case, we had to do away with mulch to at least uh, less mulch. There's still a lot of crop residue in place. 
and we did have to, you know, rake the bed and make it relatively even to run a pinpoint seeder down it. You know, it's a multiple, uh, you know, most of you are probably familiar, Johnny Saul's pinpoint seeders. And so it took a little more bread prep by hand, but it was still achievable with this no-till system with high residues, you know, took some effort with the, with the uh, uh, high residue condition. Here's an earthway with less bed preparation, simply pushed down through the seed uh, bed surface. And, you know, it still did reasonable. Clumped the seeds here and there a little bit. Not too, too bad. Uh, but, you know, uh, definitely a little more 10 seed clumping, but, you know, it was fast, way faster than the preparation I did for the pinpoint seeder. And here is simply broadcasting the seed over the bed surface. And so, which basically took, you know, zilcho time in bed preparation. It's just scattering the seeds on the soil surface and churning them about. Didn't even mulch on top of that, it's just crop residues and things like that. So basically, you know, just kind of demonstration. I, I don't want, even though we do so much broadcast seeding, there's no reason you can run any kind of seeding equipment still through this system if that's what you desire or need. When sometimes when uh, you're just getting into, uh, let's see what we got now, we have to go back. Uh, sometimes when you're just getting into no-till for your first year, you still might need to hoe. And it is difficult to hoe in a high residue in environment, but not impossible. So uh, if in your first years, when you're just starting out, instead of just experimenting with some broad, you might want to just experiment with broadcast seeding, still do rows so that you have the option of hoeing if you do need to. But essentially, in the end, to be able to just scatter seeds on a soil surface is uh, very quick, efficient, and high yielding. So, um, I'm still going to talk about mulch, but here we're going to talk about transplanting. Transplanting, uh, we do some of. In this case, uh, these are kale transplants set up against uh, some carrot seed that's about to be harvested. And for transplanting into this bedding system, it's very easy. You know, the, the soil surface is largely mulched in place, and often it's even easier, really, than, than, than broadcast seeding. Uh, I mean, obviously, transplanting on your hands and knees takes a little effort. But again, we would just rip a furrow for something like kale, uh, kale is grown in seed beds, so we're just transferring from a high density planting into a, a more spaced out, uh, lower density planting. So these are just bare root seedlings we just dug from over there and put into the fields over here. And uh, so yeah, there's no reason not to just jump in with transplanting. Uh, again, a furrow was ripped. If it's something like a tomato or something, we're not going to rip a giant furrow for a two foot spaced tomato and we'll use uh, these tools. So these are uh, uh, spading, little uh, transplanting shovel and a, and a trench, trenching shovel, or sp yeah, trenching shovel there, very long. Uh, so basically, we'll just pop out uh, a little chunk of earth every two feet for the tomato transplant. There's a two foot mark on the shaft of the shovel so that uh, if you can just you plunk out your little piece, you can just lay the shovel down a little bit to see where the next two foot mark is, chunk out that piece, set your next, you know, and follow the transplants. So uh, that's how we set, you know, transplants if we're not going to furrow with some of the furrowing equipment that I described. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about mulches. So Basically, for mulching, we use three different materials. We use straw, leaf, and wood chip. Uh, all high carbonaceous materials, and those go on, on top of the compost or soil to mulch the plant in with, or the seeds, seeds or plants. And so what this is, this is a bale chopper. And this grinds up uh, hay or straw into a much uh, easier to work with uh, chopped material for spreading on the soil surface or around plants. Uh, that is a track one. 
does a, has a little finer chop, chopping action. The tractor mounted one with its PTO drive is way faster and grinds up tremendous amounts of material very quickly. Uh, so, but you know, they both have their place. Not that we use them that much because straw, first of all, we don't use hay at all in the mulching. Uh, we use only straw and they use sickle bar blades to chop up. Both, both grinders use sickle bar blades, but it gives you a very chopped uh, mulch material. This is actually hay here, back when we used to still use hay. Uh, so uh, straw is the most expensive of those three ingredients. And though we definitely do incorporate it and we utilize it is one of the mulches because we like a diversity of ingredients in our uh, mulch environment. Uh, it is actually probably the least conducive to growth and germination of the three mulches and uh, harder to deal with because you have to grind it or you don't necessarily have to grind it but depending on what straw it came from the uh, Rye has a tendency to be very long fibered, whereas something like barley or oat might tend to be lower and more chopped up right from the baling equipment. So the rye has, uh, you know, a need maybe to get run through if you're going to use it directly on the field. And then also, uh, unless the straw is specifically grown as a mulch material, uh, straw being, of course, the stems of uh, grain crops. Unless the straw was grown specifically for use as a mulch, which, you know, we growers will do, they will grow a rye crop on a field and harvest it before it goes to seed and sell it to you as a mulch. Great, no weed seed heads in it. The weeds, of course, being the seed of the grain itself. However, vast majorities of straw, of course, come from grain production. Uh, and the combines never get all the seeds out of the straw. And those grains are very fast growing annual grasses. So they are definitely a weed. Not tremendously, uh, you know, tenacious weed. I mean, they certainly pull out easily enough and you know, they don't have tenacity of like a lot of the real annual weeds, but uh, definitely can get in the way of crops because of their fast growing nature. So if we have a, 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 a straw that is, has grain still in it, what we do in that case is we take the straw and we, and we simply, uh, well, we might grind it if it needs grinding, but if it doesn't, uh, like bar our barley straw we're using presently, we will just pile it outside and let it get rained on. The rain sprouts the grain seed, and then when we go to utilize the now wet straw, it, is, it effectively kills those sprouted plants. So that's how we can uh, use a grain-laden uh, straw, is by pre-sprouting the material. You have a question? Are you just buying conventional straw? Great question. No, we would never buy conventional straw. Yeah, even worse than glyphosate is uh, there's a class of persistent herbicides uh, that are uh, they're like amino chloropyrid and uh, a lot of ones that end in chloropyrid and uh, what the heck is the other ones? Oh, the poor brain. Anyway, I'm not too big on herbicide names, but uh, even worse, uh, you know, glyphosate bad enough. But there's uh, numerous herbicides that get used in grain production that uh, are known as persistent herbicides by the composting uh, trade. The, this group of pest uh, herbicides do not decompose even in a composting situation. So it, they are the absolute bane and terror of commercial composting. And so, you know, commercial composters can talk your ear off about that. Carl Wolf, I think, is going to be here. He would be able to talk your ear off about the persistent herbicide difficulty. Picloram is one of the more common ones as well. Uh, they, they're just completely tenacious. They, they are not ready to break down. They are 
broad leaf herbicides, which almost all the vegetables are broad leaf. They kill broad leaf plants. They will let grasses and grains and corn grow, and they're going to kill all the broad leaves. Uh, those residues are getting into agricultural systems everywhere because the grains are grown with them. Dow and DuPont make them, well, it's one company now, right? Uh, DuPont Dow, uh, Dow Pont, uh, puts its rate on the label, don't use manure from animals that have eaten feeds grown with this herbicide on vegetable crops. Okay? How do any of us know what animals ate what grains and how much, which herbicide got used on which grains and which fields and ended up in which feed and ended up. And so the whole, the whole manure strain uh, stream is highly contaminated and of a suspicious origin. The stuff is uh, toxic at very low levels, does not degrade in the animal digestive tract, does not degrade under standard composting situations, and certainly would be a hazard in mulch materials of hay and uh, even grass cuttings. So how do, you, how do you keep all, all that stuff out of your mulch streams? How do you right. So how do you make sure you don't have herbicide contamination in your mulch? Yeah, you got to know where you get your straw from. So basically, I have a couple growers in state in Connecticut that specifically grow straw for me. So they know that I will buy whatever straw they can grow. I told them my requirements, and I'm willing to pay a reasonable amount, they, maybe a $6 for a 40 to 50 pound bale of straw. Uh, and then if I need additional straw, I reach out to commercial organic growers in upstate Maine that are growing uh, you know, long-standing farms that have been organic certified that are growing uh, grains, mostly in rotation with potatoes. And so we can truck the large, usually 1,000 pound bales down on trucks and uh, we'll stockpile those and use those. So the c growers in state uh, know what I'm looking for and they're growing straw on purpose. No grain contamination, I don't have to pre-sprout it. The commercial stuff that comes down from Maine, I have to pre-sprout. Uh, so, and now that I talked about persistent herbicides, that's also gonna hold true of manure sources when I'm talking about composting. Uh, so again, you gotta know where your manure is coming from and what those animals have eaten, which, you know, I don't think any of the farms that I work with locally are organic certified, but uh, they generally don't use any pesticides and cer are certain of my requirements so that the materials that I am getting are not contaminated with those materials. So uh, now, so that gets back to straw as being the most likely contaminated substance of the mulch materials that I named, wood chip, straw, and leaf. We don't use hay, which would offer sim the similar contamination issues, but uh, it, hay also has, uh, it's a perennial grass. So it's loaded with perennial seeds often, especially first cut. Uh, and so we can totally contaminate a field with perennial weeds, uh, which under a tillage system isn't a big deal because tillers cream uh, perennial weeds, but under a no-till system, perennial weeds have to be very carefully watched. So uh, hay is out. Hay comes in and some of the manure from our grass-fed animals that we haul in, and so there's a little chance of contamination, but that runs through a composting system, and uh, generally we won't run into any weed seed difficulties. So now getting back to mulch and its application. So uh, now wood chip is generally, by commercial composting, you know, wood and wood chip and leaf, forestry materials in particular are considered about the safest material in terms of chemical contamination. So, uh, you know, wood chip particularly. Uh, leaf, you know, it kind of depends on where it's getting sucked up. Uh, you know, sometimes it can have some grass mixed in with it. It might have been chemically treated or something like that. But by far and large, leaf and wood chip are pretty much, you know, your safest bet if you're going to be hauling in organic materials to your farm in terms of chemical contamination. So, but we like all three of them, 
and we like them all mixed together because the soil appreciates uh, a diversity of diet. And so what we find, and this is a mulch trial right here, is why I'm lingering on this picture. Uh, this is a, a, a trial of three different kinds of straw, straight wood chip, straight leaf, and a full mixture of the three put together. And although you can't see great with this picture, there certainly there was huge differences, like you can see in the just straw area right in the middle there, much weaker germination uh, and growth than under leaf or wood chip, which is more forefront here. This is another mulch straw right at the beginning. So it goes mulch straw, wood chip, a straw with really poor germination, then uh, a leaf, which had really good germination, and then uh, a mixed mulch at the top, which did really well too. But by far, you know, the straight leaf did really well, which is understandable. It's partially decomposed, it holds moisture in it, essentially it looks like compost itself. So did very well, but there was definite differences in germination and I've replicated this. And so that's why I'm kind of presenting it to you. It's not the only time we saw straight straw behave worse than leaf or the mixtures and things like that. But what's usually shocking is how well wood chip does, just straight wood chip. Now, this is also, although I'm showing this to you and discussing our trials, you also have to take into consideration that this is our field that has had incredible levels of biological activity in 30 years of intensive uh, fertilization and growing and the organic matter content is very high. It's extremely biologically active. Uh, a low functioning field may well not do well with wood chip applied directly on top of it. So, you know, you gotta, of course, trial these things yourself. And let me just talk about trialing uh, just a little bit. I'm gonna try to talk about it more later too. But essentially, uh, we trial things all the time, constantly, daily. Uh, and the simplest trial which is very easy to do and can be done so easily on a, on a daily basis is whatever you are doing, don't do it to a little area. So that always is your check against what did what you do, was it worth it? Did it make it better? Did it make it worse? Did it not do anything at all? And so constantly, constantly, constantly that little bit gets left. And then we go back and we look. And so there is trials all over the place, constantly going on, simply by not doing something. And uh, so, and that's how you refine. It's the easiest way to refine. Obviously, sometimes we'll run more extensive trials where we'll match things up, doink, 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 down a field and do you know, more extensive trials. We do a lot of that too. But constant trialing with physical examination of the results. And certainly, you know, we'll pull in information from soil testing or, you know, theory and things like that to, to kind of guide us. But this is where, you know, we actually figure out what needs to be done at a given time in a different given condition on the fields that we're personally working with. It's by constant trial and physical examination of the results. So now getting back to how much mulch to put down. How much mulch to put down is somewhat variable because a larger seed can handle more mulch, a potato can handle a giant pile of mulch, and a very fine seed can handle hardly any mulch at all because you can't smother out the seed from germinating. So it really is variable. Uh, basically, at the minimum, I like the soil to be almost fully covered so you can't see the soil compost. So just a little bit on top of it. If it's a really fine seed, I'll see some soil, you know. But if it's like a standard, like a lettuce or something, I'm not really gonna see the soil. Maybe here or there a little bit, but just a little layer, a thin layer that fully covers the soil surface, which acts as, of course, a protective cover. Now, I should talk about that in the layering process and what we're doing here. That whole procedure that I showed you of seeding uh, is very specific to uh, being able to take care of all those materials. Like when we take compost and biological inoculant out of its pile and spread it out on the surface of the field, we have just uh, uh, presented the conditions for its degradation 
to it, to take something that has been in a pile in a moist, humid, dark environment and go strewing it in a thin layer on the soil surface with wind and sun, uh, you can easily destroy the biology that is present, that is in that compost, that is of tremendous benefit to your soils. And granted, it would generally recover over time, but you know, we really don't have time. We want everything to be fully functioning. So that is why we lay down the compost. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons why everything moves so quickly. Everything needs, is moving this quickly for many reasons like this. But the, the compost needs to be protected as soon as possible. It's not just about keeping the seed moist or adding a mulch layer for the biology to eat, which of course it's going to. Uh, it is also very important to cover that compost immediately after you have spread it out onto the open uh, soil surface. So the mulch layer is also protecting the delicate compost application that you just took all that effort of putting down onto the field. And then of course the watering in also has to do with that. Yes, it's sparking seedling germination, but it is also uh, helping to keep that compost that was just spread hydrated and able to incorporate it, incorporate into the layers that are below it. It's gonna help bring the biology up, the earthworms to start feeding and functioning. It's gonna bring up any feeder roots that need to come up to the soil surface. And so, and again, that's about the mulch too with the top dressed compost. Feeder roots under that mulch, they can come right up into organic la or uh, compost layer and be able to feed right below that mulch. If the mulch wasn't there, down an inch or so. And so all that compost right on the surface is no longer accessible to those feeder roots of those uh, plants. So it all really ties in together, but also is simply a mimicking of the natural systems that you would see in, in place. The compost, yeah, it's so, I know you didn't see the earlier segment in the morning, but basically, yes, it's a compost application. We're mimicking uh, the natural system in a forest where there's a, a mineral layer of soil, topsoil, with decomposed organic matter on top of that, and then an undecomposed organic matter on the, on the surface. So, and that is, you know, what we're mimicking in this. So that is exactly what's happening. The compost layer application is variable by what is necessary at the time, but, uh, that is exactly what, what is, in, is pl in place and going on. So the, uh, let's see, anything else to say about mulch? Mm -hmm. Oh, great, yeah, great question. Yeah, combos, uh, basically, let me talk about leaf because I talked about straw pretty well, but let's talk about leaf now. Leaf is one of my, oh, thank you. That reminded me of another thing to talk about too. So leaf is one of my favorite materials to work with. The, the soil biology loves it. The earthworms just dine on the, on the leaf to a, a very high degree. We use several different kinds of leaf. Uh, we are not particular about species in our area. There is sometimes conifer needles in it, but we are not primarily coniferous forest. So obviously we have the benefit of that. I do not know how well a straight coniferous leaf mulch would work. It prob I've heard that it works all right. Uh, however, we mo mostly work with deciduous leaves. They come in from landscapers in our local region, uh, at least primarily. They are uh, run through grinding equipment. The, the most beneficial grinding equipment is if the landscapers are mowing them, bagging them, dumping them down, and then sucking them up with their uh, leaf sucker trucks and trailers and stuff like that because the sucker is also a grinder. So those come out, you know, very finely ground, uh, ready to be used in almost any scenario. Uh, just raked leaves, unground, are a little bit, uh, not that you couldn't use them in a field, but they would have much greater chance of smothering a seed, especially a small seed underneath it. It'd be fine for garlic or something like that if they didn't blow off, because they also like to blow off in their hole. Uh, and this, you see some whole leaf here, 
but those have just fallen from the forest edge onto that field right there. They were not actually applied by us uh, on top of that straw at the beginning there. Uh, so, but however, unchopped leaf is the leaf that we utilize to a large degree in the compost manufacturing. So we'll use a lot more, so if we have a, a choice to separate when they're coming in, which load, which landscaper, uh, we're setting the chopped, more chopped leaf over here for direct application and the more bulk leaf that's unchopped over here for use in the composting situation because one of the primary compost ingredients too. Uh, and then, so all that is going on and it's very variable, like the machinery that the individual landscapers use chopped to a more or less degree, you know, what leaves they were chopping. And uh, so, it, you know, it's variable, it, but it doesn't require perfection generally either because uh, we've used almost all the materials in both composting and mulching settings. Uh, however, sometimes we run out of leaf, particularly because the forest is dying and uh, the landscapers are coming up with like 20% of the leaf that they used to bring me. So though we've increased uh, who's bringing the leaves and uh, there's still, uh, sometimes we run a little shy because we use a hundred tons of compost where leaf is one of the primary components. And so you can imagine that we use a lot of leaf. And so the leaf uh, we have had to occasionally call up our local gravel uh, yard uh, stone grinder, uh, quarry, gravel pit uh, uh, operation where the city of Willimantic piles all of its leaf in giant windrows. And so there is an endless supply of largely decomposed leaf, all stages, completely decomposed to just last year's. Your choice. You can have whatever you want. Uh, and so we've worked with all different stages of composted leaf, fresher leaf from that kind of uh, operation. But that is by far my least favorite because of garbage. There's so much garbage in city leaf. And yes, you can pick it out and oh, the leaves are affordable. You know, all they charge us is trucking. They don't, even, they don't charge us a cent for the leaf itself. Just how long it takes to truck to get it out to us. Uh, and so, although it's affordable and usable, and I would certainly use it still, and I have used it, uh, the labor, because we're finicky about not having plastic in the field, so the labor of having people go out and pick out little pieces of plastic out of the mulch is a little daunting sometimes. So, although it's a nice material, uh, and I don't, it, again, I'm not really concerned about contamination. It's, I've never seen anything like terribly ugly in city leaf, asides from lots of pieces of plastic, particularly candy wrappers, because they suck them up at Halloween. And uh, so a lot of candy wrappers, some yard debris or whatnot, but you know, it's relatively clean in terms of contamination. I've never had like laid down some leaf mulch and something didn't germinate because of some contaminant or something like that. I've never seen anything but great growth off of even city leaf. Yeah, so now wood chip uh, is uh, another great resource. Uh, in, in this case, we have a local farmer who piles them up because he's been in business for generations and all the leaf gr or tree grinding companies know to dump their wood chip at his site. So although I used to try to work with Asplund and uh, different tree side companies, uh, they were so erratic. Uh, you know, I would give them 20 bucks, drop their load off or whatever, or watermelons or whatever, you know, get them out there. I probably, they would have liked beer or more. Uh, but uh, 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 they were just so erratic that it just, in the end, it's just easier to deal with a guy that, that already deals with all those guys and kind of coagulates them all. And then uh, we haul in wood chip. Primarily in our region, of course, is deciduous trees. Uh, I'm not sure how well chipped uh, uh, conifers would do because uh, I've never experimented. There's certainly some coniferous growth in them. It's a mixture. Uh, but again, you know, we have great results uh, with wood chip, with leaf, with a mixture of the two, with a mixture of the straw mixed into all three of them. When they are applied to the field in the mixture, the, the leaf is, is almost immediately consumed by the earthworm population. Like within probably two to three weeks, 
all semblance of chopped leaf is gone from the field. The earthworms just come right up. There are so many earthworms. And the whole field itself is voraciously hungry. So we're just, we're just feeding this voraciously hungry beast. They're just pumping out so many vegetables to us. And uh, so uh, that is like, you know, basically that's what I consider that we have a very hungry soil life that is going to grow all of this stuff that we just need to keep fed, keep feeding it. You know, we, we definitely side dress some crops with fertilization materials, but when I'm laying down compost and I'm laying down mulch materials, I'm thinking about feeding my soil biology, really. And then the soil biology is going to create the conditions where the, where the crop grows. So lots of volumes of material. We're very good at material handling. The, the, the worms eat that leaf very quickly, especially if it's chopped. And then what that leaves is straw and wood chip. And straw is very pro-fungus. Fungus loves straw. There's always fungal growth on those strands of straw in that field. So I consider basically the leaf to be a great boon to my earthworms, to potentially keep the bacteria rolling. It's much more readily decomposed, but the straw gives a little more sustain and is so, makes the fungus so happy. So that's one of the my, main reasons I definitely still incorporate uh, straw. The wood chip also is fungal friendly and has way better sustain. So oftentimes we'll do a mixture of the three and we get to the end of the cropping cycle. The only thing you see left is some wood chips and not even that many of those. I mean, the soil is so biologically active, it'll, it'll break down wood chip in one crop cycle. So, and what that means for us is we never really, like when, when all these leafy greens here are done, it's, they're just mowed in and some new compost is put down or not. Uh, but there's not this level of residue left that's going to interfere with the next seeding cycle because it's being consumed so rapidly. And so that might be different in your different conditions. So, you know, obviously you got to pay attention to that kind of thing. Uh, and you might have to rake something off if it's not being consumed at, at the right rate. But in us, it is rarely a difficulty where there's too much mulch down to put the next seed down or something like that. Uh, one thing to definitely be careful of is if there was a lot of mulch in place, you don't want to put compost on top of a mulch layer because, again, that separates it from the soil and would dry out and damage the compost. Compost needs soil contact just like seeds need soil contact. So it might appear that, say, you, you could come in here and say there's all this mulch here. that You could just lay some compost on top of it and then seed into the compost because you would have seed to soil contact in the, in the compost. But uh, compost needs to be to stay hydrated and biologically active. It wants to be directly connected to the soil. Um, okay, so here's a good example. This is some of that leaf that came out of uh, uh, the, the municipal leaf piles. And you can see it's got some sticks in it and you know, a couple pebbles, stone-like things from them turning their piles about. But all in all, it is a lovely mixed material, uh, you know, some various states of decomposition, and this is the garlic coming up through that. Uh, so very, very nice material to work with if it wasn't for the garbage, of course. Okay, so... Oh, yeah, yeah, let me talk a little more about wood chips. So, no, we don't, we, we can, and some of them are aged, uh, but we don't uh, age them on purpose. We'll use anything from a fresh wood chip, just chopped, to almost fully degraded wood chips, and they've all functioned well uh, under the system. Again, might well be because of the high level of biological activity that's able to de decompose something that's that fresh versus, you know, if you had a a newer soil, you might want to start out with something that is definitely more pre-decomposed. Yeah, uh, almost all the materials are really close to free. Uh, however, I'm paying trucking because I will not run my own trucks to go get those things. So, you know, like I said, the leaf, you know, enormous, all, it's just trucking, $85 to get the truck out there for whatever it is, 20 yards of packed in leaf materials. You know, the guys 
you want to have good relationships with all your trucker, truckers because there's a big difference what a trucker can fit in their truck. And, and, and if, if they, yeah, exactly, where they want to dump it. And if you have a good relationship with your truckers, you know, and they really have value, you know, we were paying $100 for the 18 yard dump truck of wood chip, you know, I actually told the guy that I should start giving him 150 bucks, you know, because, uh, you know, th th just running his truck over is the hundred dollars. And like, you know, he's a farmer too. He's got the stuff piled up his time. So uh, leaf, wood chip, cattle manure, totally free. The vegetable scrap we use in the composting is free. It's all just trucking really. You know, there's a few ingredients, the straw, like I said, uh, you know, the mineral amendments that we utilize. So if I had to say, how much expense do we spend on uh, all of those things that I would consider fertilizer materials like compost, mulch, mineral amendments? I would say, I don't think it would be 10% of the sales of the farm. It would probably be more around like 5%. But say, let's just be theoretical and say, you were making $200,000, uh, 10% uh, would be $20,000 to spend on mulch materials and, and fertilizer materials. And, you know, we're certainly not doing anything like that. I mean, granted, we'll spend thousands of dollars. Uh, and so maybe more like, you know, $10,000, 5% or something like that uh, is probably more realistic. But it, I wouldn't bat an eyelash to spending 10% of the gross sales on fertilizer inputs, especially when you're just getting started, because the fertilizer inputs and those efforts in feeding that soil life save every other step down the line in terms of labor where your real expense is gonna be. And so to have you know, the, the, the vibrant, abundant, fast growing, healthy crops in place save everything, saves your weed control, saves your irrigation, saves your harvesting time, saves your spoilage, uh, just a processing time, you know, everything all down the line that is all labor is saved by having the proper fertility in place where the crop is going to grow in a quick, vibrant, healthy manner. So here we've got, uh, this is just an example of beets which were seeded in those rows and they did all right. They had a little sporadic germination this year. It was uh, actually a pretty poor period when we were seeding them. But this was just a demonstration that with the purslane not dying under the uh, uh, solarization event and a few other weeds in place, we actually hoed these because they were in lines. Even with this high residue environment, we came through and hoed those. So it's not impossible to cultivate. And this is what they ended up looking like, you know, quite healthy. Uh, pretty reed free, you know, a couple skips here or there, but nothing terrible. And, you know, ended up being a very nice crop in the end this year. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So it, let me talk about that. Uh, how come it's so weed free? Weeds are a response to uh, what you're doing. And so tilling a soil the earth is basically screaming that uh, it's naked and it needs to be covered. And it germinates every possible weed available to cover that surface to a certain extent, as long as it doesn't overwhelm it. So uh, to not create the conditions of emergency uh, goes a tremendous way towards uh, keeping the earth from germinating weed seeds. Now, of course, on top of that, is what's going on here is we never disturb the soil and we constantly layer materials on top of the soil, whether it's compost or mulch materials. Years go by, year after year. Uh, you know, some of them have not had tillage for almost 10 years now. 10 years of constant layering. And the composting is composting Yeah, yeah, I'll show you the composting section during the, uh, in, the, in the next time, but yeah, there's no, no weeds to speak of in the compost either. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get into compost. 
Yep. And let me check my time. We're going to break at 2.30. Oh, my gosh. How does it happen? Uh, all right. Fast paced. Fast paced. Okay. So uh, here's the carrots seeded. Uh, similar. This is broadcast seeded right next to the beets. The beets are right over there. And, you know, a pretty good stand, actually. You know, a little skip here or there. You know, I've seen them do better. Uh, solid germination, but it can't, it was, it was fine. This has had no weed control. You know, guys know how hard carrots are to grow without weeds. And uh, of course, this is what it ended up looking like, you know, with, and with broadcast seeding, the carrots are just right next to each other. There is thousands and thousands of carrots in this area. Uh, here's potatoes. No, we never thin. Uh, yes, yes, never want to thin. Uh, ever. Our market is relatively forgiving. Uh, in other words, our wholesalers with the groceries and the restaurants in the farmer's market are, uh, if we have littler carrots, it's okay. If we have really big carrots, it's okay too. You know, if you were a real specific uh, uh, wholesaler of carrots, you, you might need to dial in those seed rates better or do lot, you know, row seeding or something. But as long as you've got some flexibility uh, in your markets, you know, obviously the carrot can't be too small. Uh, or, you know, and, and that includes like a carrot's got to be bigger than like, you know, this, even though it looks like a carrot. It's just big. People don't like those. They got to be a certain size. But the, the flexibility of those seed rates that I put on that chart, you know, as long as you keep an eye for variables, should give you uh, enough of a stand without it getting too too small or too big. Uh, and I must say, carrots are a good example of the seed rate and the variance is that if this carrot planting had come in a little thicker, there would have been more carrots. Uh, they still would have been of a marketable size. If it had come in a little thinner than this, there would have been less carrots, but they would have been bigger. And, but the yield per pound per area would be still very consistent. As long as it's within this certain window, you know, the carrots themselves are gonna grow out to photosynthesize to its maximum extent in that area. And as long as there's not like skips or uh, too, too close, it's, it's gonna, you know, provide the same kind of poundage despite, you know, a relative difference in uh, germination. So how wide were the beds? Are they 58? These are 58 inch beds, yeah. Uh, it is more of a risk. Uh, I'm pretty flexible. Uh, I like everybody to be able to do everything. Uh, particularly though, my daughter, who's 14 years old, uh, she does a lot of the seeding. Uh, and so I'm back uh, getting everything ready, the right volumes of seeds. I'm handing her the, the seed volume. She's laying them down. You know, somebody else is dragging them. So it's like a con kind of constant flow. So definitely other people are involved. But it is a delicate area that you want somebody very specifically uh, well-trained to do. Yeah. And, okay, so potatoes here, I'll just talk about briefly, you know, obviously very good weed control here. What we did is we furrowed, put the potatoes in, did an initial hilling, uh, and then came over the hills with a pickup truck and laid down leaf mulch, and well, straw too, straw, leaf wood chip, the combination right out of a dump truck bed. Uh, this is just a picture of some spinach growing on a wood chip mulch and leaf. Uh, I was hoping I had some pictures of uh, the spreading equipment. So the dump truck just pulls out over the bed surface. We use a dump truck uh, on the beds with a single tire in the rear uh, to get over those beds because instead of like a manure spreader, which we have manure spreaders that fit that bedding system, but our compost and mulch piles, because we have three separate fields separated uh, by about a mile or so, it's faster for us to load the dump truck and then be able to drive over the beds than have manure spreaders being loaded in separate piles and all that kind of thing. So we deliver, even though a manure spreader might give us a little better spread sometimes, uh, just for speed of moving the materials from one feed to a field to another, we use a dump truck. Um, so this is just intensity of planting. This is showing uh, like this sweet corn was growing here next to these peppers. 
and I said, oh, I need some, I need some cress for the salad greens. So all, it, you can see that there's no weeds. So all we have to do here, all I did was I took cress seed and after the corn and peppers were up and growing for a while, you know how fast cress grows, I just threw the cress seeds onto the mulch surface and kind of knocked it around maybe with the back of a rake or something and then there's a giant line of, of cress in place. And so the weed free nature of the soil frees you up from so many things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those things that builds, you know. Like at first, you know, it took some time, but as you get weed free, it just keeps going that direction. Uh, and so we're not tolerant. I mean, weeds will grow here or there, but we never let a, a weed seed head remain in the field and dump seeds on the ground. They might come up, they might be in a crop, but if, if, it's, if it's in something, like I said, we get that seed head out of there, whether it's with knives, machetes, chop them off and pitch them out, or with mowing equipment that'll undercut it and we'll remove that material. So it's really a policy of never letting weed seeds hit the ground combined with a layering process and a very careful soil care. So this is an example of just intercropped cover crop with uh, eggplants. So uh, on the left, or in the middle essentially, uh, well on the right is a, a legume cover crop uh, field pea growing between, it was growing between the pep, uh, eggplant. And then all we did here is I just uh, basically stomped down the peas. I didn't even mow them. And we just came in with the leaf mulch and threw leaf mulch on top. So on the left, or in the middle, you can see that that's just walked on field peas with leaf mulch put over the top. And so this example of, you know, just intercropping with cover crops and uh, handling cover crops and mulching over cover crops if necessary. Obviously it could have been mowed too if there was a need to mow them. We could have hit it with a sickle or a scythe or a machete or something. But you know, a lot of cover crops don't even need that level of mowing, they simply can be squished and mulched over. Here is a cover crop going on. And cover crops, a weed-free environment for cover crops is so beneficial because now, if you're not dealing with weeds, your opportunities to use cover crops in so many different occasions uh, is, is, is much, you don't have to, you know, because. You can't plant a cover crop and then allow it to have weeds in it that goes to seed. It's just going to exasperate your problem. But uh, so now, you know, like uh, instead of that cress next to the corn, sure, I could have thrown a quick growing clover or something low growing, as long as it's an annual. Uh, but here, so let me just talk about cover cropping and what we handle, how we, how we handle that. So we seed, because most of the fields are, you know, obviously growing in the summertime. So what we do, is we come in with, uh, so this would be the red clover, the crimson clover and the rye example. Not that we don't mix other things into it, but those are the primary cover crops through winter. The, uh, the crimson clover is seeded in August at about 50 pounds to the acre, maybe 40. 40 or 50 pounds to the acre. It is seeded right over the growing vegetable field is chock full of vegetables. Uh, and we just throw 50 pounds of clover seed over the top of it right before it's gonna rain. And then that clover starts to germinate under the growing vegetables. And then we harvest the vegetables out and the clover is in place already growing. Uh, you know, it can deal with that low light level for that amount of time. And you know, the high seed rate of 40, 50 pounds an acre gives us enough uh, seeds tossed right onto the mulch surface. Then following in September, we come in with rye at about 200 pounds to the acre. And we toss the rye right over the growing crop and the rye being much more aggressive than the clover, of course, growing much quicker. Uh, we get the clover a jump, but then the rye comes up and as you saw in the earlier pictures, you know, it just gets cranky and it actually ends up vastly overpowering the clover in height and growth by the next May. So, and that is all done because of the low level of weeds. 
you know, we can just broadcast that stuff in there. It's not like we get to the end of the season, we've got to clean up weeds. Uh, you know, we can just throw those things in there. Now, actually in these fields where we do a lot of uh, rye clover, uh, cover cropping through the winter, there is some winter annual weeds like chickweed that we don't really even try to control because chickweed is not uh, a weed that interferes with our uh, mostly, you know, May to November cropping cycle. Uh, we would, on our, on our field where we grow year, year round vegetables, there is no tolerance for even chickweed or anything like that. But here, you know, we can have a little flexibility with a little chickweed or a little dead nettle. Isn't the end of the world in with these other winter annual cover crops, and probably a benefit for the diversity. Okay, just, and just one more thing about that, Bobby. In spite of the uh, new traffic on there and a dump truck, um, no big concern of compaction? No, the, uh, the soil, uh, as I said, the, the trucks and all the heavy equipment, all the tractor implements, the trucks, they all move down the same wheel track always. They never drive over a bed surface permanently. Those beds are in place for decades. They've been in the same exact place. So vehicular traffic is in very narrow tracks in between the bedding surfaces. And uh, now foot traffic on top of the beds certainly does happen sometime, sometimes, but the you know, I discussed the biological activity of the soil and how aggressive that is, and it just self loosens itself right back up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I don't know, I haven't really, I don't really have an idea of the tonnage of mulch material. If I looked at the compost application, I would bet that it approaches 30 tons to the acre, approximately. Just as kind of a rough guess. So overall, I bet we're close to applying 100 tons of compost to the three acres a year. Uh, now, the organic matter content of the soils are generally up around 10 to 12%. They've been that way pretty much uh, uh, for a long time. One, one of the fields that we use on that, the one we were just looking at on that dairy farm, uh, started at 10% organic matter and has simply maintained. Maybe it's gone up to 11 or 12, but despite constant application of additional organic materials, they don't seem to, re you know, at least with that level of organic material, they don't seem to be getting above 12%. And, you know, so they all, they're all up there around 10 to 12, and they seem to just kind of maintain at that level, you know, plus or minus one here or there, but that's pretty consistent. But we probably got to get to break time. Is, is that accurate? 2.30, I think we were supposed to go at, and I blap, oh, wow, I'm not even late. So the general trends that develop over long-term soil testing uh, is what he viewed as the most beneficial uh, information gleaned from soil testing in laboratories. So the, the longer you run with the same lab, testing the same soils at the same time of year, probably will give you a, a, a better idea of how your practices are affecting your soil mineral release and uh, your uh, general overall uh, elemental fertility, let's say. So uh, now that is soil testing. And of course, soil testing, uh, I shouldn't spend a lot of time on it, but basically, you know, they're extracting with a, a different uh, extraction medium. It can be anything from water to a very strong acid, say uh, a saturated paste extract all the way to a malic three strong acid extract. And so, you know, you can't really match one test against another from a different lab. There's different procedures in each individual lab. And there's certainly different numbers that come up on a water extract of a soil versus a, of a strong acid extract of a soil. We you do utilize both. We'll run a, a saturated paste test of water, and then we'll run a strong malic 3 acid extract on a soil. And that kind of gives you an idea of, you know, is the calcium being released under very easy water conditions, or does it take... Uh, 
a stronger acid to get more of a calcium release and just generally gives you some more information running a couple different tests year after year with the same lab. Then it comes into tissue analysis. What actually got into the plant? Uh, and so that is very interesting. Uh, our university runs uh, a $20 tissue sample analysis. Uh, for our soil tests, we go with a private laboratory. Uh, uh, but we run the tissue analysis through our local university, $20 uh, for a test. And, uh, you know, basically, it is very interesting. And what we generally see is that the, the uh, tissue analysis correlates pretty well with the weak acid extracts on a soil test. Uh, not particularly well with a strong acid extract of the soil. So, you know, that kind of clues us in a little bit and, you know, generally gives you a good idea uh, about, you know, you know, so many people are concerned about nitrogen, you know, often there's plenty of nitrogen around here. Uh, and it's more about getting enough calcium and magnesium and phosphorus into the crops than about calcium. There's so much or, uh, than about uh, potassium and, and nitrogen. So, you know, we've gleaned a lot of things about uh, crop growth, but in general, you know, it's, it's a limited science. It's, it's uh, uh, only useful to, to be a general uh, pointer for you things to experiment with. And then when it comes to SAP analysis with handheld tools, we certainly have run a, you know, tremendous amounts of SAP analysis over the years, just with our little handheld tools, refractometers and pH and whatnot. But you know, really, uh, all of it, after years of doing that kind of thing, uh, you, you just can see in the plant after you've correlated it to what you have done on your meter or whatnot, it doesn't take long for you to see a calcium deficiency or a magnesium deficiency or uh, electrical conductivity, you know, general fertilizer deficiency, energy deficiency. Uh, and so, uh, and that is also true of the soil and tissue analysis. You know, I, I already know what the soil and tissue analysis is gonna tell me. You know, I send them out because I've amassed so much information over the years. But, uh, so they're a good tool, good thing to start with, but you will readily, uh, as time goes on, be able to correlate the soil conditions to what the lab would already tell you anyway, so, or vice versa. And so now let's get on to talking about how do we actually create conditions of balance. And in your handout, I do have a, a crop balance uh, sheet. And you know, you probably, probably have heard about balancing crops uh, through chemical analysis or your fungal to nitrogen or fungal to a bacteria ratio. But. Brian, do you have any more? Oh, yeah, yeah, I have a giant pile of them here. Uh, here, I'll let you sort through because you got to get it. It's long. It goes from, it starts at no till and ends at low tunnel. Uh, sure. And so. Really, what it gets, it, it gets back to a, a crop balancing for me is, yes, it's about my calcium to magnesium ratio or my nitrogen to carbon ratio. And we are talking about balancing forces. But, and this is what biodynamics is very useful, useful for, is because when, when I talk about crop balancing and, and soil fertility balancing, I'm not talking about just those things. Uh, everything is interacting together in uh, very complex uh, arrangements. And so there is basically uh, two oppositional forces at work in crop growth that I seek to manipulate to bring 
uh, the appropriate crop to fru fruition. And so those, those oppositional forces or two forces that are interlinked but uh, can be taken to extremes generally relate to what I discussed early, earlier of a lushness and a excessively constricted growth. And what I mean by that is that there's certain fertilizers and uh, environmental conditions that lead to lushness, which is a weak growth. And then there's certain environmental conditions that lead to a stunted growth of a very hardened nature. And the way you treat the soil, the soil's inherent makeup, and uh, uh, how you fertilize the soil is dramatically tied to these forces at work with each other. In the plant, uh, what that will look like is a tendency towards moving to flowering in fruit formation or a tendency to move towards sizing and bulking. Uh, and so uh, to appropriately manage the, the crop so that it is moving in the proper direction is very useful for both profitability and for uh, taking care of the soil. When you see how a crop is growing, is it lush? Is it too small in flowering too early? Those are major indicators of your environmental condition and how you have treated your soil. So, uh, and yes, you want to influence those things, but they're also flags waving at you saying, this is how the environment and the plant is interacting here. And if you want it on a broad scale to change, you need to direct things in a different direction. So, uh, it's important to realize the, the tendency of these two kind of forces at work. There's a lot of descriptions of them. Like I said, yin and yang, male and female, positive, negative. You know, it all comes down to kind of the forces working back and forth. And they have very similar effects, the different forces on the plant growth. So... Uh, so obviously, let me just point out some simple economic examples. Do you want your cabbage to be small and go to flower? No. Uh, you want it to have a huge head and never go to flower, essentially. Uh, do you want your pepper to be giant leafy thing that has green peppers still on it uh, and no red peppers in September? Or do you want the pepper plant to have ripe peppers on it in July? So uh, those things are very much uh, in your control and uh, are important to understand that you as the farmer are directing that crop, hopefully intentionally, to what you are seeking in concert with natural forces, of course. So nature is very much willing to collaborate with us to achieve what we're looking for in crop production. But just to be able to conceive of that is what we are doing. We are guiding uh, the plants into one of these different conditions, which pretty much can, can be laid out in a polarity-like situation. So in the handout, I do give some simple examples of what a, a leaf growth enhancing conditions look like. And then over here, I call it flowering and reproduction force and what kind of things would lead to that kind of condition. So under the leaf growth condition, we have, and I'm just gonna read down my chart. I think yours is even more extensive than what I've written down here, but we have uh, water, uh, moonlight, we have shade, we have valley condition, we have cold, we have earthly influences, interior, calcium, nitrogen, bacteria, potassium, and so on. You have even more better examples on that handout. Uh, all of those things lead to a bulky plant and delay flowering. 
and a lot of them go hand in hand where obviously in a valley location is more watery, uh, it's shadier, uh, it's colder, you know, the, earth, the sun can't penetrate uh, of a more earthly nature. Uh, tends to be uh, higher in nitrogen. The soils are clay in nature instead of uh, coarser materials. So uh, it all goes hand in hand, often, but not necessarily. And vice versa, some flowering and reproduction forces are air, drying forces, and wind, direct sunlight, uh, very light, yep, sun, light conditions, mountaintop conditions, warmth, uh, cosmic influences, including the sun. Uh, part of the, in, in the exterior, fungal relationships, silica, magnesium, carbon, and, uh, you know, sandy conditions. So, for instance, we grow in a valley. Uh, our fields are all valley fields. My in-laws, they are smack on top of what should be a mountain, but it's a very tall hill, uh, and they're right at the top of it. Their crops come out... Uh, very, very uh, short with uh, large uh, roots on them, very early uh, pepper set and eggplant set, but very, very short plants. His beets, the tops will be about this tall. Our beets, the tops are about this tall. And so under a valley location, with those influences at work, to add nitrogen to that situation is just going to exasperate a problem, okay? My in-laws, they will have great response to nitrogen fertilizer on top of that hill, okay? I add nitrogen to my early valley location. <laughs> but, you know, but in the end, if I add and to exasperate this problem, it will lead to these excessive conditions, like large, weak, lush growth, delayed flowering. A soft and watery vegetable, uh, which of course uh, is flavorless with washed out pigments, hairy roots, feeder roots everywhere instead of a big tap root, uh, uh, signs of deficiencies of, of the opposite, like magnesium or potassium, or uh, phosphorus, I mean. And of course, very prone to insect and particularly diseases. So, disease, and prone to diseases under that condition. So by adding nitrogen into that lush valley location, easily leads down the road to uh, difficulties in crop production later. And so, however, the environmental conditions of my in-laws, again, very responsive to uh, a nitrogen fertilizer. So what I'm trying to do for you guys is understand, again, that your environmental condition of your farm's location and what, you're, what you are working with in your particular area is going to be very dramatically influence what materials you put into your compost and into your fertility system. And labs are very poor at picking up that kind of information. So, uh, and that is primary, primary. Your location is primary and your soil that you are working with is primary. So for you to be able to read these signs by how the crop is growing, you will, you will begin to see how you need to move your composting and fertilization system in order to achieve the kind of crop growth that you're looking for. So vice versa, an excessive, you know, like a stunted growth, excessive uh, flowering reproductive, you know, can stunt plants. The flowering is ridiculously early. The radish comes up and bolts immediately, never even makes a radish, you know. Uh, could have been delayed maybe with a, a calcium or nitrogen type fertilization practice. Uh, Hard and fibrous, you know, too, too hard. The other one's too soft. You, you can taste it in the textures of the vegetables, the, the texture of the vegetable, the softness, the hardness, the flavor of the vegetable. Uh, the watery vegetable is flavorless. The uh, excessively constricted vegetable has uh, bitter, pungent type flavors that are, that are off-putting. 
uh, it may well pigment under a excessively constricted condition, but it's not, not particularly red and off colors, but it's not really uh, a, an appropriate pigmentation that you're looking for. And, and uh, of course, has very hairy leaves often. Certainly can run into insect uh, difficulties, and certainly like one of the most common examples of this would be a nitrogen deficiency, which you know, a vegetable under a nitrogen deficiency, like I said, can bolt easily, hard and fibrous, uh, often bad tasting. So those are some of your basic concepts of how to work with uh, these growth forces when you put together your composting and fertilizer plan. There's some additional information on here. Uh, Yeah, tr you know, and I got into, uh, you know, trials, trial, trial, trial. Like I said, you're fertilizing with a mater material 95% of an area. Always, always against a control, certainly line up different materials next to each other. Uh, do not dim diminish your own intuition and your own ability to know what needs to go on uh, we're very intuitive and the whole world is interconnected and there's information coming to us from all different places. And so uh, your own ability to know what to do is right inside of you. And so often with very superior ideas to a laboratory analysis. So don't diminish your own intuitions and trial your own intuitions, certainly. You know, things that come to you from signs in the field or in your dreams or other spiritual contact uh, are very useful for determining what you personally need to do in your crop production system. So uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about what I believe is on the bottom of that sheet because we do have a lot to talk about, but basically, uh, plants go through uh, various, you know, growth times. Of, here I have it written out as the leaf period, the flowering period, and the fruit formation period. And it has written across here, this is from Korean Natural Farming, uh, some different ideas for about the, when the crop would appreciate more or less of a given fertilizer material. So, you know, when you want leaves, you obviously increase your nitrogen and lower your carbon content. Nitrogen to carbon ratio is lowered. Uh, when you want fruit, uh, not time for uh, nitrogen fertilization, much more time for keeping the carbon high to keep it strong, to keep it from being uh, prone to diseases and uh, and so on across this chart. You get some ideas about different growth periods and when to increase or decrease efforts on uh, various materials to increase those uh, uh, forces at work in crop production. So now let's look at composting. Now that you have a basic kind of idea about, you know, different, how to adjust your fertility system, I'm just going to talk about composting and how we have adjusted our composting system for basically no-till. So one of the uh, so, as I said, we're in a valley location. We have piles of nitrogen uh, available. We have 10, 12 percent organic matter. We're in a, in a valley where nitrogen tends to accumulate. And uh, so we keep our nitrogen level in our compost pile pretty darn low. And instead, the compost is all about keeping the carbon up and getting trace minerals in there, calcium and magnesium. Uh, and keeping the things that uh, our, our crops respond well to and try, trying to keep the nitrogen content actually relatively low. Potassium as well. Not that there isn't plenty of potassium in trees and things like that, but in general, uh, plenty of nitrogen, potassium, that's very common on organic vegetable farms as well. And the, the real objective is to get your calcium, magnesium, uh, phosphorus levels up and your crop uh, trace elements as well. So, uh, however, with the high carbon uh, nature of the compost, we uh, generally the piles run relatively cool. They run at about 120 degrees instead of 150 degrees. So it's a much more fungal friendly 
composting system. A lot of wood, a lot of leaf, a lot of, lot of carbon, lower temperatures. Yeah, yeah, composting straight through. And uh, so it is a very fungal rich compost, high in all of those elements that I just previously mentioned. And, uh, uh, and uh, the temperatures are kept relatively low. Here we've got uh, starting to pile up some of the materials. And this was one of the famous days where I, I managed to pile a fresh load of cattle manure way too close to my wife's fresh laundry. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a mistake that I have not repeated. Uh, so uh, it does, the smell sticks to things, it turns out. And, uh, but anyway, so here we're piling some materials in. But I'm going to go through, oh boy, this slide's a little out of place. But this is side dressing a liquid fertilizer along the side of some celery plants, which we are going to talk about after composting. Oh, well, I guess we're going to talk about liquid fertilization now. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm just going to talk about it briefly, and we'll get back to it. But this is, you see, you see some of the examples. So this is the irrigation pump has got a suction tank hooked into it to suck in, we got a valve, we crack it, and we suck in a small amount of liquid fertilizer into the stream on the suction side of the pump and move a, a small amount of fertilizer material up into the irrigation system. We have one inch hose lines which put out a lot of water to stand there with a hose, you want it to go as fast as possible. And then we have a, fat, a flat fan spray hose end on the end of that. And so this can put out a lot of water very quickly in a flat pattern that can go along the side of a crop. So that's how we can get liquid fertilization over you know, a large area to side dress a crop with a liquid fertilizer. Basically, when you look at fertilization, you've got three opportunities to fertilize. You have pre-plant fertilizer application, which for us is always in the compost. Uh, we don't come out there with raw minerals or fertilizers. Anything pre-plant in terms of compost or in terms of fertilizer materials is pre-composted, run through the composting system, and then applied to the compost system or to the soil system uh, through, through the composting. But however, as a plant is growing is when it needs more nutrition. As I said earlier, uh, a very small plant needs very little fertilizer. And in fact, fertilizer makes, as I said, the, the small plant weak, too, too fat, too young, too lazy. So you don't want to, certainly don't want to apply too much fertilizer pre-plant. Uh, you want to add available fertilizer materials along the side of the plant if it is a crop that's going to be a long season crop or require additional nutrition past what the soil is simply supplying. So examples of that would be like tomatoes, in this case celery, uh, maybe a cabbage crop, uh, but you know, salad greens, radishes, you know, fast growing things, they never receive additional fertilization. They just grow off the fertility that's in place. Uh, but for longer season crops, they will get side dressed. Uh, side dressing is uh, the compost application. I, show, I showed you the, the two kind of forces at work and compost and pre-plant fertilization is a way to adjust that in a field wide setting in general. When it comes to an individual crop, so in other words, uh, the, the field is a valley location, it's too wet, it's too shady, it needs this, these other forces at work. So we're gonna go heavy on the car carbon sources. We're gonna get the magnesium in there, we're gonna get the silica in there. Uh, and so that's overall balancing. We overall balance the field condition through the composting system and the pre-plant fertilization system. When it comes time to grow a cabbage or a red pepper on the same soil, it is the side dress fertilization that guides that plant to a specific end that we are looking for. In other words, with the pre-plant, we're just adjusting the whole thing to kind of be in the middle. But then when we have a specific crop, we're going to want to guide it potentially one way or another. So the side dressing of the crop is when we approach 
the, uh, the specific guidance of the individual crop is through, through uh, side dress. Side dressing can also happen with solid materials, specifically prepared composts and such uh, that have specific uh, materials added to them. And then mulch can be raked aside just a little bit, uh, five gallon buckets or something. We can dump down compost along the side of the crop and then put the mulch back over the top, all the better if you water it in. The feeder roots respond very quickly and we'll get into that uh, side dressed compost within days. So side dressing with solid materials is also very effective or with a liquid material like this. A liquid material on top of mulch, however, you have to apply enough water to actually get it through the mulch so it's not just sitting on the surface of the, of the mulch. Um, so, and then even simpler, you know, is uh, we get a lot of excess milk. Uh, and so sometimes we'll just, which you got a lot of clotted cream or something in it, difficult to run through an uh, irrigation system or whatever, but on a smaller scale or, or less, we'll just uh, side dress directly uh, through buckets or watering cans, uh, liquid materials along the side of the crop. The, uh, yeah, see there's some clotted cream in there. A great fertilizer is milk. Uh, this is milk and seaweed and uh, maybe a little molasses. So that's just like a, a pretty easy uh, side dress fertilizer material that we utilize a good bit. Sometimes we'll put seawater in there too. But let's get back to composting. So again, this is where the loader tractor is really important because not only is it picking it up for delivery into the field, it is also uh, the means of turning the piles and, and maintaining the piles uh, in, in their windrows. So that is the biological inoculant out of place also. Hmm. Somehow some slides got out of place on me, so I'm, I'm gonna run through these quick. Hopefully it won't upset you guys too much to be a little out of order here. This is a weed control knife, and this is a weed. Uh, <laughs> and since we cannot hoe when crops are broadcast, uh, if there are weeds growing in the field, annual weeds at least, we will eradicate them with a serrated harvest knife, uh, like this, there just sliced off right at the soil surface, maybe slightly below that. So that did not disturb the soil. You see, if we had pulled that plant, the soil would have been disturbed, and crops next to it would have been disturbed, but we simply sliced the plant off with uh, serrated harvest knives. And then uh, the annual roots die on that plant. Here's some perennial enemies. This one is yellow dock. Uh, that comes in on hay. This one's Canada thistle, probably our, our most severe uh, difficulty is to deal with that. This is quack grass. I left this quack grass in place and grew it a little bit just so I could take this picture, which is uh, quack grass in this kind of aggregated soil, you can literally just grab it and pull it out of the soil. Now under our tillage system, when the soils were more condensed and compacted, we could never have gotten quack grass out of the soil like that. So again, I'm just trying to indicate that when the soils are functioning, everything becomes easier, easier whether it's weed control, irrigation, harvesting, uh, pulling quack grass. Uh, this is our old uh, adversary, uh, Gallinsoga, which was basically the only weed left in the field when we were under more intensive uh, mechanical weed control, hose and equipment, it's so fast and is a very, uh, it's a weed of fertility and uh, disturbance. And so it was very much indicated, it was beating us over the head that we needed to change what we were doing. And so we finally did, we finally listened to it. Here is uh, a numerous selection of hoes. We have even more hoes than what is demonstrated here, but for weed control, particularly when we were on uh, rows, on beds and, uh, we had every size hoe available and we used them all, all the time. We had great weed control, but we are still battling Gallinsoga all the time. Uh, we don't have enough time for me to talk about weed control with hoes too much, but uh, basically weed control would start out with very fine hoes when the crop was just germinating. I mean, potentially it could even start out with, say, a carrot. You seeded some carrots 
uh, which take like seven or 10 days to germinate, we would hoe over the surface of the bed five days after seeding in a blind cultivation, essentially, uh, just to wipe out the surface. And then in a couple of days, the carrots would come up through and they're in lines. And then we would start with very small hoes that don't send a lot of soil onto the road, uh, rows of, of, of crop. Uh, because you would smother them under the soil. And then as a crop gets bigger, you can come in with more aggressive hoes that do throw soil into the lines of uh, the crop, say the carrot. So as you're trying to smother the little in-row weeds that are growing in with the rows. So it would start out with very fine hoes and work up to larger and larger hoes. Uh, the hoes, that hoe on the, on the left is a grub hoe. That's not really for uh, inter, not in, for control of weeds, uh, it's more for grubbing out, like I said, during winter when we can't solarize with those sheets. Oh, solarization can only occur basically from sometime in April to sometime in October in Connecticut. And then so if we need to turn over a bed in the winter wintertime, uh, we, we have to just mow off the residue and hoe off the residue with a big hoe, which is not very difficult because crop residues in winter are pretty weak, you know, it's just like carrot roots or beet or uh, spinach roots or something like that. It's not like you're trying to hoe down massive growth or something. Uh, so that's what the bigger hoes are for. A couple furrowing hoes there. And then the tined hoe that I said, you know, can help. Uh, here is uh, some winter vegetable production under low tunnels. I'm gonna hope to get to, uh, hope to get to that to discuss a little bit of winter vegetable growing. This is example of pigmentation. And this is purple top turnip, which it was very purple. And so under high nitrogen conditions, where we've had just enormous tops of turnip, uh, we also had the conditions of very white turnips and a white turnip then was also very prone to black rot and other diseases. So when we saw this level of pigmentation in this turnip crop, we already knew that it was gonna be incredibly insect and disease resistant turnip crop and that's exactly what happened. And so pigmentation is a, is a huge indicator for us because as I said earlier, uh, for the plants to be in a fully functioning metabolic state, uh, they will create more intensive pigmentation uh, or at least more appropriate intensive pigmentation, I should say. And so when we start to see this kind of pigmentation, uh, it's a very strong indicator of all those other things I was talking about, insect and disease resistance and flavors and uh, sugar content. And so here is a garlic crop from 2014 uh, where we were seeing, you know, really, you know, the pigmentation was building up. The, previously, when we were in a tillage system, again, this garlic was just white and we would harvest it, we would do fine, but uh, we would see that now, even though it was traditionally referred to as a white garlic, it was getting these purple pigmentations and uh, really starting to color up. And every year that goes by, I think this is the next year, the pigmentation has just gotten in more and more intense. So now we're seeing you know, violet shades and all kinds of uh, really intense pigmentation. I mean, to go from a white garlic in you know, same garlic we've been growing for 30 years and just see this dramatic change because of our changes in tillage and fertilization uh, is quite dramatic. Uh, pigmentation, this is red salad bowl lettuce. Uh, one, the red green lettuces, the ones that have both on it are great indicator plants, just like that purple top turnip because I've certainly grown red salad bowl lettuce and have it almost come out green and vice versa, you know, this is really well balanced, but I've seen it pigment even to darker shades of red. I've seen red salad bowl lettuce that is by far redder than any of the super red lettuces that the seed companies will sell you as a super red lettuce. So really, again, you know, the, the pigmentation level, great indicator of what's going on in the soil, how you're treating it. Obviously, the washed out pigments are a strong indicator. Uh, and for us, a really high level of uh, pigmentation is a, is a very positive sign. Here is a winter radish trial where uh, in this particular bed got tilled for a little bit of quack grass was in it where I run an experiment where I, I did everything exactly the same. Uh, 
in terms of compost and fertility and, and, uh, and put side by side this radish which was tilled and ended up having some yellow leaves and disease in it next to this radish which was completely perfect every single leaf. And side by side again, experimentation, the only difference was I had run a rototiller over this bed and not done that on the bed right next to it. So those are the kinds of you know, experiments that really led us down the road of really pursuing no-till and some of these more gentle treatments uh, and appropriate fertilization. Here's watermelons. These are ripe watermelons that we're harvesting out of the field and there's been no dieback on the, the watermelon plants, which we had never seen under a tillage system. Uh, uh, potatoes, you can see the weed free nature of so much. This is, this is turnip. Uh, never, there's been no weed control in that patch whatsoever. Uh, tomato plants, we're just going to kind of cruise through. We, under the tillage system, they used to get a lot of early blight and uh, septoria, and they would die before frost. And actually, they actually, I don't think they made it to frost this year, but in general, uh, tremendous reduction in leaf diseases on the tomatoes, and now they go to frost by and large with the tomatoes. Here's the garlic, one of the garlic crops anyway, and you see we're getting a very good height, uh, very, very strong growth. We used to lose uh, maybe three or five percent of garlics to neck rot, where you go to pull the garlic and the bulb stays behind. We, when we've switched to the new system, we harvested 20,000 of them last year, and probably less than five plants stayed behind from a neck rot scenario. Yeah, it's all hard neck there. There's some so soft neck. The hard neck starts up, depends on uh, some of it we low tunnel so that we can get into early market with it. So we'll start harvesting it in uh, like mid June, the stuff from under the low tunnel because it's sized so much quicker. And that's very useful for securing early markets to sell the whole later crop into. And so we'll start in uh, mid June and we'll have the rest of it out by mid July. Um, this is just a simple example of, this was a, a strawberry renovation where we rototilled, the strawberries had been in place for a few years and we rototilled that area. Actually it was a demonstration that you can get rid of quack grass by three rototillings. Because I had often said that, but so I, uh, I really, I was like, all right, let's demonstrate it here. There was quack grass, got into the strawberries eventually after numerous years. And so we mowed it down, we rototilled it, we waited two weeks, we rototilled it, we waited two weeks and rototilled it. And all the quack grass was gone under uh, that four week period it, with three rototillings eliminated quackgrass out of the field. So, but what was interesting about it is that then we put a kale crop onto it and the field was completely loaded with annual weeds after the rototilling event. Uh, you know, obviously stirred up, se stirred up seeds, but it was far more than that. It was the earth responding to such an aggressive disturbance. I mean, it was absolutely carpeted. I mean, not granted the kale was bigger, it was kale transplants we said in there, so we knew we were gonna have a problem. But uh, yeah, just really shocking. Uh, onion transplants, these are, this is an onion seed bed, but the, the point here really is just the intensity of planting. The onions are grown in seed beds. We grow a lot of seed beds and we, not so much greenhouses. We'll use the greenhouses for hot season crops like tomatoes and peppers, transplants and eggplants and things. But basically we seed the onions this time of year in low tunnel bedding and uh, the, the, all the transplants grow aggressively through the winter so that by say March, end of March, we have uh, you know, onions are about this tall, about as big as my finger and we can start setting them in the field nice and early with really low levels of care. Uh, the onions are just broadcast seeded, like I said, covered with a row cover, basically never weeded. I mean, we'll look at them if they need some weed control and then it's just a mat of onion seedlings come up. Uh, we never have to water them. Uh, and in March, they're ready to go. And we just do bare root transplants. And we do a lot of seed beds of just like, we'll grow kale in a seed bed or cabbage in a seed bed, and then just move them out out of the in density plantings into a more spaced planting. With, so it requires a lot less uh, effort. So here, 
is an example was the carrots, again, a different carrot planting, but it's just got, it shows a very simple sprinkler that we have in place if we need to use a sprinkler system. All the fields can use sprinkler irrigation if they need to. Yes, we completely got rid of the drip irrigation system, which is just so nice not to have to deal with all that junk and uh, put it down, lay it down, pick it up, make it run, blah, 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 all gone. And, uh, you know, we just, the soil is able to maintain its own moisture content, but we do have a backup system in place if we need to use it, which really, you know, I remember laying these out because uh, we're like, well, maybe we're gonna have to start irrigating, but then it rained and we never irrigated actually, even, even this year where I got them out to, to start. So this is carrots. Again, you can see, you know, very weed free. This is, this is simply reaching down and pulling up the carrots. And you can see how many carrots you can grow in a broadcast seeded situation like this. I mean, the, uh, I think this year it was like a bushel to three feet or something down those beds. It was just a tremendous volumes of carrots all just right next to each other. Do, 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 right down the bed. So, uh, you know, very high quality, again, much less disease and insect pressures because of the nature of the soil. Uh, winter squash yields are really good too. Ryan, yeah. Did, did you at one point uh, do, do the bed raised beds and not yeah, we couldn't move to broadcast seeding until we switched to no-till because you can't have broadcast seeding if you have weeds. I mean, you can pick out a few weeds out of a broadcast seeding, but the, but the point of, of growing crops in rows is so that you can hoe or cultivate between the row. And so you, you can't switch to broadcast seeding until you've got the weeds initially under control, which is what I was saying that if you're gonna switch into no-till, uh, maybe in the first year, particularly, obviously trial it, go, go slow, just do some area in your first year. Don't just all of a sudden try to do it because there's, you know, you got to learn a few things, but uh, lay down, do some rows and still be able to hoe uh, in your first year. And then once you're sure that you're not getting any kind of significant weed growth from the layering, from the gentle treatment of the soil, then you can switch into a, a broadcast seeding as opposed to just trying it right off. Cause I've seen people get, you know, really bad results trying to go too fast into, into broadcast. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yields are, you know, all, all of this has led to much more higher yields, better profitability, happier work. Yeah. So it's all just, you know, to, to rifle through weeds to find a crop. How irritating, you know, uh, to, to just go out there and have it all lined up, ready to go. That's not only efficient, but uh, way more pleasing. And uh, so here is uh, downy mildew, no downy mildew on the basil crop this year. On August 29th, it did eventually get uh, downy mildew in September, but not, didn't succumb to downy mildew till, you know, mid late September which if you guys are familiar with basil downy mildew, it has uh, been a serious problem lately. So every year we have seen the basil go later and later with its ability to resist uh, downy mildew. No, aphids, aphids are uh, uh, a symptom of excessive growth force, too much nitrogen, too much water. And so as you rein that in, uh, you really generally won't have difficulty with with aphids. Uh, this is arugula on 6-4, open planted with no flea beetle. Uh, now that wasn't true this year. Uh, we did get some flea beetles, not terrible. I think all the plantings were still marketable, but we had some holes in the leaf this year. But this is a couple years ago or three years ago, wide open seeding of arugula, no flea beetles. Uh, very intensive, the number of scallions, for instance, you can grow in a bed is phenomenally high. Uh, you know, broadcast seeded, like I said, and along with like those carrots. Flower production, my daughter is very uh, uh, talented, cut flower grower, uh, very useful for bringing beneficial insects and predatory insects into the production system. So I really appreciate those and her efforts there. Uh, and this is slugs. Uh, which I'm going to talk about slugs 
I'm going to talk about slugs now. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, look at that garlic. Yeah. So slugs, so the traditional difficulties of which the, the, the slandering or the, the, the difficulties that are stated about this kind of organic matter usage no-till system would be uh, uh, slugs, rodents, and delayed warming of the soil. I have never seen a difficulty with delayed warming in the soil because as far as I can tell, the, the soil is warm from the level of biological activity that is in the soil. So I've never experienced that. Maybe that is true if the soil isn't active and then you mulch it over, probably, but uh, that is, I've never experienced that myself. Uh, rodents, there's rodents out there. There's been a rodent plague that has come through our region about three or four years ago, right after that tremendous fruit year. <clears throat> and so there's, there's rodents out there and rodents were bad about three or four years ago. The rodents were no worse on this farm though than on any other farm that was around me that utilized this tillage or, or not. So uh, I haven't really seen uh, any difference from when we were under a tillage system or other farms that are under tillage systems compared to the rodents on our farm. If anything, I think it went down. Uh, like our potato crop uh, we used to get a lot more rodent damage, but you know, I think rodents appreciated the loosened nature of a tilled soil compared to a more consistent uh, soil that we have now. It's not quite as loose as it was under a tillage system. So all in all, I would say actually that we have less uh, rodent damage under the mulch and, and no-till system. However, slugs are problematic and certainly were problematic before. I do not know if they're more problematic now, maybe, but they, regardless, they are still a problem. And slugs are very related to those conditions that I was talking about of uh, excessive nitrogen and excessive watery conditions. A lush, uh, weak plant is very prone to, to slug damage. Slugs are not willy-nilly. I have seen many times where slugs directly delineate a certain soil characteristic to the exact position, which this is an example of. This is a pooled area of this field where it's a depression in the field. It, the soil being in that position for who knows how long, probably a very long time since the last glacier or something, has created a certain characteristic in this soil that makes it heavier and wetter. It is a depressed area. The slugs delineate those areas perfectly. And they, they will not go ashore to the next soil condition. And so if slugs were just willy-nilly gonna get everything, you know, you would see much more random damage than that. But seeing their nature, how much their damage is tied to the soil characteristics has led me to the conclusion that they are, are definitely a strong soil indicator. Now obviously under a wet condition it's raining all the time and it's spring and you've got a valley location. Slugs are probably going to get everywhere because the whole place is too watery. Things that keep slugs at bay are very related to all the things that are on this sheet for reproductive uh, forces. Slugs don't like sun, slugs don't like air and drying out, they're not on my father-in-law's uh, hilltop farm, you know, sunlight, warmth. Uh, they do not, they, you know, they seem to do all right under carbon conditions, but certainly they like the nitrogen-rich, lush position. They do not like silica. Uh, they don't like sand. Uh, magnesium uh, sulfate, Epsom salt, they don't like salt, particularly magnesium sulfate or... Uh, the uh, many other salts that are of a reproductive force nature. So it is not, you know, just coincidence that slugs are repulsed or killed by all those materials 
that are on that side of the chart and they are enthusiastic about everything on the other side of the chart. So if you're having a lot of slug damage, it's another sign to move things in the other direction. So, but yes, you gotta pay attention to slugs. We still get slug damage in the spring. Everything isn't perfect on our farm. You know, we run into problems. You know, wet season, we're in a valley, we'll get slug damage, you know. Things definitely still happen, but by and large, dramatic improvements over the years. So this is, you know, even a year later or something, and you know, the pigmentation of the garlics is uh, pretty extraordinary. Uh, oh yeah, we're, we already did that. What's that? Yeah, got, escapes get cut on the garlic. This is an interesting example of uh, uh, based probably a magnesium or manganese chlorosis uh, on this crop. Uh, corn, you know, good physical indicator to look at. Uh, the corn, same row, just further down, where the soils were uh, a little more clay in nature. And uh, so... Uh, this one was very specific. And so these are the kinds of things that, you know, are very significant when you're looking at going across a row and you see all of a sudden a bunch of uh, uh, obvious nutrient deficiency further down the row, uh, you know, you're not seeing that. Those are the kinds of things, you know, to observe, pay a lot of attention to. Uh, this is an example of what we're looking for. This, so a radish, we want the radish to have a small top and a big bottom like that. Not be too fibrous, not be too watery. And so this is a balanced radish. And that is what we are looking for. If we came and that required us working with carbon and reproductive force to, to keep back our nitrogen and water and, and excesses in our valley. So we amended, because normally our radishes come out with huge tops and uh, eventually they'll get a, a, a large bottom, but you know, often it's disproportionate. So these are the kinds of things that you want to manage and be active, and they're indicators for you as you see these things growing in the field. Uh, you know, I talked about all the tree damage and things like that, and, but this is pokeweed growing on the side of the field with a nutrient deficiency, which you, know, you would think pokeweed with its giant roots and being a weed and all that wouldn't necessarily run into uh, nutrient deficiencies. Uh, and so, but one of the things I wanted to say is, at first, when I would see things go wrong on my farm, I used to beat myself up uh, because I thought, oh, I'm not doing that right, or, you know, something, you know, it was, uh, uh, one of the best things about realizing that, you know, everything is struggling severely in the, in the overall environment is that it made me realize that we are struggling against very difficult conditions. And, you know, it's not your, our, your my lack of doing something, it's that things are very difficult. And so uh, it really helped to understand how interconnected everything is and how difficult things have become to, and because this happens to a lot of older growers and things, they're like, you know, I've lost my touch or, you know, whatever, something went wrong, I burned my field out, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't them. It was the overall environment has deteriorated so that uh, what was a very effective effort in system in the past just no longer functions well. And it's not their fault. They're doing the same thing that was appropriate and successful. It's that things, the environment has changed and made it very difficult for people. So uh, there's a cover crop in there. I don't, all right, so we're into foliar fertilization. I'm gonna go ahead and keep running through these slides because hopefully uh, my composting slides are coming up after this. <laughs> I am low on time, so I guess it's not the end of the world. So I'm going to talk about foliar fertilization, and then I'll just wing composting if it doesn't come up after foliar fertilization. So as I said earlier, you know, your compost application is uh, your first broad field application, and then the the side dressing is the primary time to influence the crop in a certain direction. Uh, and that's when you apply fertilizer materials that are traditionally thought of as fertilizer materials. Foliar fertilization is basically your last 
uh, fertilization period. And this is when you have the ability to apply very small amounts of materials in order to uh, further guide the crop. It is not a time to apply traditional fertilizer materials. I'm not trying to get a bunch of nitrogen into the crop at this point. Uh, it is about very small amounts of very important materials that will aid the plant both in its direction towards flowering or lack of flowering and ripening uh, or lack thereof and uh, disease and insect resistance. So uh, this is, is you know, basically uh, like an herbal preparations and, and supplements for health of the crop, not for growth and overall uh, sizing. And so it is much more uh, very similar to human supplementation for health. And a lot of the materials are very similar, similar to uh, human health materials. Uh, we use a lot of extracts of plants. We use seawater. We use some milk, uh, raw milk, and the materials in small but very effective uh, states. So we use, for starters, this is an example of straining our biological inoculant, which we, is called IMO. We go out into the forest, we culture the forest microbiology, we bring it back to the farm, and then we uh, increase that to a large extent uh, through a very specific culturing process. So basically it's the forest microbiology brought to a high level of activity. Uh, I'll discuss that uh, in a few minutes with the culture steps. The, uh, this, however, to, uh, it basically looks like compost pretty much, but it's all fungus and very smells like the forest. And so we have to uh, aggressively stir that forest-like material and then strain it to be able to run it through the uh, foliar sprays. Uh, any other material, like I can't allow those milk clods to be in the sprayer either. Anything else that is going to clog a sprayer is run through the strainer as well. And then we just line up a pile of five gallon buckets, even more than this. We do about 20, 25 gallons uh, per acre. And so, you know, we'll end up with like 15 buckets or 20 buckets or a lot of buckets we'll run. Well, no, more, we usually about, maybe about four buckets of fields, so about 12, bu 12 buckets. Uh, and here's some of the other ingredients. Uh, on your foliar fertilization sheet is a full description of all these materials and when we use them and for what and different things like that. But basically, uh, we use a lot of sea products, but specifically sea salt and sea weed. Uh, uh, and that's what those primarily are right there. And uh, a lot of herbal extracts and honey, uh, uh, horsetail, biodynamic preparations of silica and things like that. Uh, a lot of hardening type crops because of our valley location and excessive lushness. So silica, uh, uh, magnesium, the seawater extract that we use is a lot of magnesium chloride, uh, a lot of trace elements from the ocean water. And so it's basically a hardening a vinegar, we use vinegar, vinegar extracts of eggshells, uh, extracting the exterior, the silicas and the calciums from the exterior of a shell to form a shell barrier in the cellular uh, surface of the plants. Uh, so it's a very, for us, it's a very hardening uh, material that assists the plant to harden. Uh, again, paying physical attention to the crop in order to determine have you over hardened the crop because it's very effective. And although a hardened lettuce leaf will not succumb to downy mildew, it is also often too hard and becomes less palatable if you get to too hard of a state. So uh, again, you know, thinking about where you are on the spectrum of lushness and hardness and how to adjust it through the use of fertilizer materials, foliar materials in this case, uh, the foliar materials that we utilize are all essentially edible. Like I would have not a qualm, although I wouldn't 
actively do that, but you could, you could drink that material. Uh, anything that I'm going to spray on a crop this late in its growth period, I would want to be consumable by a human. So uh, yeah, edible foliar materials. There's a lot of them on your sheet there. There we are mixing it up. Oh no, they're applying, this is like uh, from Korean natural farming, a lot of extracts of herbs using fermentation and alcohol extracts. Uh, that's honey or uh, silica uh, horsetail tea. Uh, a lot of different herbal extracts. You can see there's some milk in there, a little cream on top. Uh, this is a vinegar extract of eggshells. Again, it's the exterior force. Uh, and here is stirring. You see a lot of feet, a lot of buckets, a talented person, most of them will be able to stir two buckets. You see there's, yep. And aggressive stirring, creating for vortexes. Uh, pretty uh, similar to biodynamics. Uh, the vortex is very useful for being able to impart the force of your mind into that material, which I don't have time to get into further, but uh, transitional states between liquid and air, or solid and liquid, are a very uh, influential time to be able to apply your mind and consciousness and prayer into the material you're working with. Uh, after the vortex is formed, uh, a stopping the vortex and creating a, a chaotic environment uh, and then starting the stirring in the opposite direction, back and forth, chaos, vortex, chaos, vortex. Uh, that goes on anywhere from like five to, oh, they really got into it here, a bunch of, oh, look at all these. Okay. And then we load the jackdaws up on a stair or on a table so you don't have to lift it up off the ground. And, uh, and then we're in the field spraying. The spraying action is a back and forth, uh, the wand back and forth. It's very gentle, it's very quiet, it's very meditative. Again, it's time, perfect time when the air and the water are interacting as that mist. Uh, excellent time to use your consciousness to influence the material and the crop growth in place. And it's a back and forth movement as the foliar material is sprayed out onto the field. And there's back, uh, there's forth. Slow, steady gait, slow, steady pumping. Uh, the sprayer itself is uh, uh, double-headed. So the, we have adapted with a splitter, the spray end to be two-pronged. Uh, with a wider uh, nozzle output per sprayer so that more material is put out per pump. Uh, very, it's way faster than having what they will sell you as a single spray end with a little output orifice. So uh, much more material, much faster uh, to adapt those, not very expensive. The, there is a filter screen in the end of the spray wand that does need to be cleaned occasionally. Uh, since the material is edible, you know, I don't mind blowing out the, the screen or you can pump a little water out of the disassembled wand and kind of wash it off with the actual spray material. But uh, be careful not to lose those parts in the field when, if you're doing it in the field, of course. These are Jackdo backpack sprayers and I do like them simply because they have a simple mechanical uh, mixing mechanism. It's just like a plate that moves up and down in the tank as you're pumping so that it keeps the material agitated better than a lot of other sprayers. So uh, just basic backpack sprayer though. We wash them out at the end of spraying. Hey, there it is. Okay. A little, a little out of place. I thought it was before those. Yeah, mornings. Yeah, you couldn't, you know, the plants would also be responsive in the evening, but generally it's already getting too wet. It will do it on a cloudy morning or clear, not rainy though. We wouldn't want to just put the stuff out there and then have it get washed off in the rain. And you know, there's a little bit other, you'll see on the description, you know, obviously I'm kind of abbreviating things now, but the, in the handout, you know, we use a little bit small amount of soap in there to help it to stick. Uh, some of the materials are kind of sticky. There's uh, various things to make it more bioavailable, but uh, uh, 
uh, just very simple ingredients, or at least somewhat simple. They, it can be really simple. Like I, I gave you an example in there of a relatively complex formula just to demonstrate all the different materials that we use uh, at a very intense period, like trying to s s keep fungal diseases off crops in the middle of August, you know, under a very watery period or something. But in general, you know, a foliar spray can be as simple as some seawater uh, mixed with regular water or, you know, some milk and some uh, seaweed, liquid seaweed extract or something like that. But, you know, there's plenty of good examples in there of different materials and hopefully you can get an idea which materials you, can, you need to work with. Okay, so let's talk about composting now. So, again, this is the piles and now I can run through them better. Ah, fresh start at it, okay. All right, this is where we left off. Okay, so the, low, the compost yard. So the compost yard basically needs to be pretty strong to support a tractor, particularly under wet conditions. So it is all built on top of uh, processed gravel, essentially, which is a mixture of like stone and gravel. And I, I vastly prefer this kind of setup than like a slab because although I have created somewhat of an impervious uh, condition with the processed gravel on, the, on top of the soil here, uh, it is not totally impervious. And there's a soil uh, compost pile interaction still going on. You know, there's earthworms in that soil that can move up even though it's a lot of gravel you know, and whatnot, but in biology that is in place still in that soil that moves back and forth, moisture moving back and forth. So uh, it is a, but a very firm condition, not only for the tractor, but obviously for the delivery trucks who, you know, drivers really don't like muddy compost delivery sites, you know, and so they pull in, they see some processed gravel, you know, shining there amidst all that compost material, but they know that underneath there is that shining material that they love so much, they're much happier, you know. I, sometimes I do that on purpose. I, got, I know I got a new truck driver coming or something. I'll like take the loader and I'll, I'll scrape it special to like show a little, a little extra gravel so they know what they're, oh, they're so happy when they see that kind of thing. And uh, so also weed free, note that there is no weeds growing around or by these piles uh, by and large. You know, sometimes if we end up with one off to the side, there might be a little bit of stuff we have to control along the side. But in general, you know, no weeds anywhere to be seen that could contaminate the piles. And this is piling. Yeah, this example of a pile off to the side where there's a little growth on the side there we have to knock back. But this is uh, example of piling some materials. And basically what we do is when we're first starting a compost pile, the first thing to do is lay down a layer of wood chip, like about a foot thick. And we, then we base and we build everything on top of a thick layer of wood chip. And of course that wood chip uh, gets us good aeration underneath and, uh, uh, and, and and keeps the pile from being too wet and allows a little water flow through it. So uh, uh, very beneficial for us to start with the compost uh, on top of wood chip. Then we do some mineral additions as well. You can see some minerals getting put on there as the piles are being assembled. And uh, there's a dump truck coming in, a small truck with the cattle manure. And here we are mixing or moving the piles from one area to another. So uh, this is dry application of minerals, rock minerals, to the compost pile. Very dusty and dangerous. Uh, so you have to be very careful uh, applying minerals in this fashion. Uh, what we prefer to do, here are some piles already built uh, with an obvious mineral addition to them. Uh, what we vastly prefer is to mix the minerals into water and then spray them on the pile as we are assembling the piles with the loader tractor. So not only is that less dusty and less dangerous for our lungs, but we get a much more even uh, spread of the mineral materials into the compost 
as well. So we, we liquefy the materials. Uh, if they're salts, like we use a lot of sea salt or sea water, uh, some of the trace elements like uh, uh, manganese sulfate or zinc sulfate will, will liquefy. Uh, but a lot of them, because uh, by and large, most of them aren't soluble salts like that that we apply to the compost system. They are, uh, nope, I don't have a picture of it, uh, or more less soluble rock, ground rock materials like talc or rock phosphate or gypsum. And those materials uh, will run through a pump, but they have to be constantly stirred and agitated to keep them in the solution. So we generally have two tanks. We have one tank with the soluble uh, salts in it that is easy to pump out and liquefy. And then we have a, a larger stock tank uh, that another person has to be physically agitating. Uh, my daughter usually does that. And then we have a, another person spraying and another person with the loader tractor assembling the compost pile. So often that's a three person procedure. Uh, and Let's see, this is what the piles look like. You can see a lot of carbon-based materials. Uh, this, is, uh, this is basically considered a finished compost here with lots of wood still present, some leaf still present, but not uh, cattle manure, uh, which I'm gonna talk about the in in individual ingredients in a second. Uh, I forgot to mention that specifically tough areas of the uh, compost pad, of course, received just stone treatment where we would lay down stone first and then put down the processed gravel on top of it. There's some processed gravel coming in. Uh, and here is the individual ingredients. So basically we have a very high carbon content compost. We use a lot of wood chip, straw, and leaf. For uh, the nitrogen component, we use cattle manure and vegetable scrap. Straw is certainly incorporated into the compost to some degree, but much less so than the other carbonaceous materials because again, of its expense. Uh, here's an example though of just straw being roughly piled outside. It's covered there. And here it's just been uh, allowed to sit out in the open and sprout whatever grains were in it. And then we use the loader to pick it up and move it into the mulch system or into the uh, uh, composting system. So uh, this is wood chip. We discussed wood chip pretty thoroughly. So I'm not gonna talk more about that, but I would say that wood chip is one of the primary components. Uh, we use a lot of wood chip and a lot of leaf in the compost, particularly the wood chip though, because the wood chip uh, 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 bulks the pile up and is of a coarse enough nature that it allows air to readily move into the pile, which is important when you're assembling large size compost piles. So the, the, the high wood chip volume in the compost is important for not having to turn the pile hardly at all. We often will turn it once after assembly in order to incorporate some more minerals, ensure everything's getting, make sure everything's getting uh, homogenous, but uh, very little turning, which is of benefit not only for labor and effort, but certainly for the soil fungus or compost funguses and things that are thriving from a low level of disturbance, which is what we're after. So, uh, and then again, the wood chip ends up as being kind of a mulch material that is still a residue in the compost that is applied to the field. Yeah. You add, in addition to obviously your base, you're mm -hmm. not doing much, you're also adding um, chip at your, at yeah. your, yeah. as your, yeah, exactly. Solution. Yes. Which essentially, it's quoted, I think, in your uh, handout there, but it looks something like, you know, and it's all like, 40% wood chip, uh, maybe 20% leaf, 10% uh, straw, 60, 70, and then 30% uh, cattle manure and vegetable scrap, just as a rough idea. And what that really is, and then maybe 10% uh, 
quarry dust for a mineral clay fragment or subsoil, clay subsoil, to give it a clay uh, composition in the, in the pile as well. The, uh, which is basic, and that's 110%, which, you know, is always better than 100%. Uh, it's like 11. And so, uh, but basically it's just a scoop of tractor four, you know, scoop uh, wood chip, scoop of leaf, scoop, or two scoops of wood chip, scoop of leaf, scoop of uh, cattle manure, scoop of straw, go back to the leaf. So it's just basically number of buckets. You know, you could look at it as percentage, but certainly it's just bucket. Uh, and so uh, very high in wood. Now that is very useful for us because of our production system where we need wood in our system. We need the high carbon. We're in a valley. We have too much nitrogen. We have too much lush growth. We need the, the constriction of the carbon uh, and we're not going to turn that wood chip into the soil. You could never take this compost and put it on a field, turn it in and expect a, a reasonable result. There's too much undecomposed wooden fragments in the compost. When we switch to no-till, it, it made compost manufacturing so much easier because uh, to incorporate a compost into the soil, it has to be perfect. It has to be well done, it, uh, well decomposed. Often it's too decomposed if you got it that decomposed anyway. And instead, by surface applying the compost, you have it still in a state of not full decomposition to really, you want to feed the soil life uh, with these materials. And so if you have a completely finished compost that's cold it, and old, it, you're not going to get the same level of uh, soil life response as you will to a younger compost surface applied. And then the, 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 the soil biology can bring that material, just like nature intended, into the soil at its rate instead of you forcing it into the soil. So uh, young compost, high in carbon. And again, you know, you'll have to adjust that to your ex field conditions, depending. This is just some leaf. Uh, I oh, no, that's wood chip again. Uh, here's some leaf off to the side, I guess. But uh, we will cover the leaf sometimes to keep it dry, uh, but usually we don't even bother with that. Um, this, I believe this is the vegetable scrap pile covered with other materials. Here's a dump truck bringing in the manure, and here is the delivery. When we go to deliver to our grocers and restaurants and things, we backhaul vegetable scrap. And so, uh, Let's talk, since I talked, I think I talked enough about carbon sources, but let's talk about nitrogen sources. So cattle manure from grass-fed cattle is about the best we can do for a manure source and a nitrogen source. It is the, the, the cattle have a, an incredible digestive system that, that takes these materials and adds a certain biology to them that is, has traditionally always been viewed as the best manure source for vegetable production. Okay, and not that you can't use other manures, but you know, cattle manure, to some degree cow manure, uh, has always been the highest regarded material for vegetable crops. And so that is still true to this day. And so, but however, modern dairies are highly contaminated. So uh, with chemical pollutants, veterinarian care, all kinds of hormones, uh, all kinds of shenanigans. And so cattle are much healthier, require much less chemical intervention in general. And uh, so, and this farm in particular is quite good at that, you know, they're not purists, but you know, very little, very rarely will you see a veterinarian out there. The feeds are simply uh, pasture all summer long. And then when things start freezing up, they bring them into uh, lots where they feed the cattle their hay on concrete pads. And the concrete pads, to avoid them getting mucked up and stuff, so they have infield concrete pads with uh, hay 
in their feeders, and then of course the cattle pull the feed out and stomp it and uh, deposit manure on it, and then uh, we come in with uh, loader tractors, There's some concrete blocks to push against on the pads, and we scoop up the winter deposited manures and hay residues to backhaul to the farm. The cattle manure piles generally are heating really hot already by the time we get them to the farm. Usually they're already at 150 degrees, particularly if we started piling them on the pads over at the cattle farm. Uh, so the stuff is all preheating and uh, relatively clean, you know, material about as clean as we could possibly hope for. Uh, so just be careful of manure sources, but a really good one is a really useful, particularly, uh, you know, in the cattle species. So, uh, I have not worked with sheep manure. I don't think ever. It's probably one of the only manures I've never really worked with, but, uh, uh, you know, I'm, you know, they have a pretty good digestive tract. I would assume that it would go somewhat similar, uh, you know, but that digestive tract on, on, uh, is amazing. Uh, those animals are walking compost piles, you know, that giant rumen, it's huge. The, that's the whole, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, so the individual piles are probably like 30 yard piles and that truck coming in there probably held what, maybe like three yards of material or something. Uh, so let me see if I got a better picture. Yeah. All right. So this is the vegetable scrap piled. And I think earlier I had some, yeah. All right. Well, this, this will give you an idea. So both the cattle manure and the vegetable scrap are piled, sometimes separately, sometimes kind of together, uh, but both of them are, are piled on top of wood chip and then incorporated with a bunch of carbon material. So they're, they're actually pre-composting because these materials come in at different times and I may or may not be ready to assemble full-scale compost piles. So essentially in, on this compost pad are separate piles of leaf, straw, wood chip, uh, which is going to be the mulch materials or the compost materials. Then there's separate piles of cattle manure uh, and vegetable scrap, both with the carbon materials already mixed into them to keep them from putrefying or losing uh, nutrient to the air and to start them in the composting procedure. Then when I say we take a scoop of cattle manure or a scoop of vegetable scrap, it actually also already contains a high level of carbon, just to give you an idea of how much carbon materials. It's, it's not even, I don't take a scoop of straight vegetable scrap. I take a scoop of maybe like vegetable scrap that's maybe 20% vegetable. And the cattle manure is similar. Maybe it's a higher content, but there's hay in it. And then there's additional leaf and wood chip put into the cattle manure. So when I take a scoop of cattle manure, it's probably like, you know, maybe 30% cattle manure or something. So just to give you an idea, it's a very carbon rich uh, composting system, but they are pre-composting. And these pre-composting piles of vegetable scrap and cattle manure often are heating pretty high. So, you know, they might preheat to 150 and be cooking along, but then when we take them out of that and mix them into large volumes of carbon material to make the large scale, compost piles, that's when the temperatures generally fall back to about 120 degrees, very beneficial for fungal activity, and then they kind of cruise at about 120, start dropping off. Various time periods, usually, you know, depends on if it's cold or warm, but usually if we are assembling compost piles now, they will be ready to use by late spring. If we assemble them in the spring, uh, they would be ready by summertime because of the higher temperatures during the, during the summer. So, you know, anywhere from like six, eight months to maybe four months or so, five months, uh, is about how long the process takes, you know, a little variable. If we hit anything objectionable, like some vegetable scrap didn't break down or some cattle manure didn't break down, we simply toss that back into the next composting system. But essentially we consider the compost to be finished when you no longer see 
uh, the nitrogen materials. There's, you can't see that there was made of manure or vegetable scrap uh, to any significant degree. And they have cooled down to some degree, say probably at like around 80 degrees or so. Usually we like them to still be active. We don't want it cold and dead, but we want it definitely on the downslide uh, so as not to burn anything that we're gonna be putting into it. So, yep, that's the general plan there. Uh, this is the quarry dust delivered from a local quarry. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, oh, primarily the wood chip. The wood chip is the, is the yes, large key to getting the air into the pile. The base of wood chip and then the addition of even more wood chip is, is, makes it so coarse that the uh, air readily enters. If, if you're not getting enough air, the, the materials, particularly a cattle manure or vegetable scrap, will have an off smell, very particular odor. Uh, very pungent, kind of stick to you kind of odor, and uh, can have like a black coloration to it. Uh, so it like over darkens. It's very obvious if something went wrong. And if we hit a patch of that in one of the piles, we just come in with a loader and haul that chunk off, throw it into the next uh, compost, and, and run it through again. Yeah, we've been using goat manure, and we've had extremely good results with mm -hmm. goat manure. Mm -hmm. They have the five stomachs like the cow. Right, right, right. Yeah, we've used. Yeah, we've used the goat manures. Uh, lots we had. We used to have a lot more chickens, chicken manure, and you know, horses not so good. A lot of veterinarian care, but you know, we've worked with so many of them over the years, and you can get good results out of any of them. It's just that the the, the cow and the cattle are just so uh, traditionally viewed as very well balanced with the proper microbiology. But yeah, any of them, you know, you, you just need a little more tweaking, a little more adjustment. Uh, quarry dust comes in from uh, local quarries is the end product of rock crushing and is a clay-like material which allows for uh, a, a base for the humic compounds, the, the aggregation of the compost to build upon. So providing the compost with a clay material uh, is very helpful, even if it's just like 5%. I mean, obviously a lot of the minerals we spray on, the talc, uh, rock phosphate, those are clay materials as well, but uh, additional of a little bit of clay material, very good for structuring the soil into, or in the, the compost into uh, uh, very useful building blocks that, that, that can re more readily aggregate than if it's just straight organic matters. Obviously I'm running out of time, so I better really crank out these last slides. We cover the compost, if periods of excessive rain. Uh, so we've had a little bit of coverage on them this year. Not so much though. It, by excessive, I mean, is it gonna rain five inches on top of the pile? In general, they're mostly uncovered uh, and it does reasonably well. Uh, specific composts are arranged, oops. Uh, potting soil is manufactured from compost. So we take the cattle manure and uh, compost it separately in a separate compost, small little pile, much more, there's all human effort turned and things, uh, in order to create, uh, leaf is mixed into it, but no wood, because uh, potting soil, we wouldn't want wood in the uh, potting medium. Undeco the undecomposed wood would not work in potting soil. So we can't just take compost from our regular composting system and make potting soil from it, really. So we very specifically blend the compost for uh, potting soil, and then you know, add all kinds of other ingredients to it too, coconut quars, a little bit of rice hull, some minerals, and then we cover it with a tarp and then a heavy straw cover to keep it uh, from freezing over winter when we need it in February. Here it is covered with straw on top of it. Uh, there's a soil picture for some reason. Here's the worm bins. Uh, we also compost in worm, uh, worm composting in 55 gallon drums. That is to provide the potting soil with some worm crumbs, but also uh, very importantly, we, it, we get a liquid verma wash extract by pouring water through these bins 
uh, uh, bottom screen collects, uh, the water goes through a screen in the bottom and collects in those buckets to give us a liquid uh, worm compost extract that we use to buffer fertilizer materials, salts particularly, uh, which we use a lot of seawater and other salts in the liquid side dress. So uh, applying straight salts to a uh, living biological system can be a little challenging, but instead we buffer them with uh, a, a carbon extract of uh, this verma, verma composting system. Uh, that's just worm feed, worm feed, compost assembly. This is turning the potting soil by hand, compost application. I think that's, oh, the chickens love the composting system, obviously. We barely ever have to feed our chickens. We don't have that many left. They've been preyed upon recently. But, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of chicken food comes out of just letting them roam on top of those piles. Uh, here is an a example of, this is the dump truck depositing compost. This is just compost application pictures. Uh, I'm glad we have that one in there because that's what it looks like. You know, we have refuse hooks. We're working that material down onto the bed surface. You can see we can get an even enough spread. It barely is going to need raking. In this case, the rye has been just simply raked into the wheel track uh, in order to just compost down the middle of the bed. Uh, there is a long-handled refuse hook there, a pitchfork as well. Here it is going over the bed surface. You see that uh, it's a converted regular pickup truck. Uh, because that fit the bedding system. Here it is going over potato hills. Uh, this is probably actually a mulch application right over the uh, two rows of potatoes there. Uh, and so that's how we de de uh, supply, put a lot of compost and mulch down using that procedure. Uh, here is, this is for the smaller field, we have a dump cart mounted right on it to bring the forest microbiology into a high level of functioning. So uh, it's a Korean natural farming procedure. And basically what you do is you take a wooden box and you put a, uh, it could be other container too, but this is just a standard procedure. Cedar wooden box, you know, we made a box. And you fill it full of partially cooked uh, grain. You know, we often use rice, an organically uh, grown grain or rice or uh, that kind of material, about half cooked with about half the water that you would normally use. So it's kind of like a hard, partially cooked uh, grain, which of course sterilizes that grain. And then you put it in the box, and you bring it out into the forest, and you bury it in a particularly good location. Uh, that often is underneath a large deciduous tree that might have been around for a while. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to be the healthiest tree, but something reasonable that has survived and, uh, you know, kind of been in its environment. Uh, however, when you're out in the forest, use your senses to determine what is the proper area to, de to collect a microbial culture from. There's, there's odors in the forest, the smell of the fungus, uh, you know, what, what are the animals telling you, what does the terrain look like. Basically, you just kind of use your senses to, to figure out where to place your box to collect uh, a microbial culture. And you bury it into the soil or into the leaf mulch and kind of heap additional leaf on it to keep it from drying out. Uh, and that is what the box looks like usually after about a week. So it just becomes covered in a white fungal growth. So we've, we've successfully uh, cultured the forest microbiology here. It moved into the box and is prolific. It smells like the forest. Uh, it looks like the, the white mycelium that is around. And uh, so, and then we take this back to the farm and we mix it with brown sugar at a one, it's all written in your handout there. We mix it with brown sugar at a one to one ratio and that kind of stabilizes it, but keeps it fed. And then we take that material, we cover it with a porous lid and we'll store it in the root cellar. Uh, but we take that material and liquefy it and pour it onto a pile of uh, bran. Uh, and bran is a very effective uh, culture uh, substrate, I guess you would call it. And within a few days, there's an absolute explosion of the 
it's very similar organisms that you just captured in the forest. So basically you're taking forest microbiology and increasing it by tremendous volumes. And here's some pictures of it. Uh, temperature, again, you want to keep down to 120 or below, so it might require stirring or watering. Uh, uh, generally, at least one watering after uh, initial assembly. And that goes on for about a week until it starts to cool. Oh, and this was a great picture where it's actually frothing. The, the IMO was frothing at us. And so we got a picture of a frothing IMO culture. Very exciting, very lively. And eventually we will keep the pile covered. There's a tarp handy in case of excessive rain. The covers we often use are just the grain bags from the brand or uh, we'll use uh, leaf or other materials like that just to cover the pile over. But you can see the white growth underneath there. The sticks are to keep that tarp from smothering it too much. Uh, at this point, actually, we, we do it more in windrows type thing and have large hoops that keep the plastic off. And actually, we've actually actually switched to, with the hoops, keeping the pile covered under the black plastic uh, all the time, under essentially a black plastic tunnel, because we found that it gives even better results because, you know, it's trapping in humidity, keeping out the sun, keeping out the wind. And although we still keep the surface covered with leaf or uh, paper bags or things like that, the addition of a, of a black plastic tarp over the top yeah, oh yeah, there's a picture of it. And then in the end, I don't know if that's the last, oh yeah, I think this is the end where we have now mixed soil into the, the material. That's kind of the final step of it is that uh, once the pile is cooking on that bran or even if you're in an emergency and need to cool it, the introduction of soil at a 50 to 50% 50 volume uh, then acclimates all those forest microorganisms and kind of they interface into your soil uh, so that it ends up looking like uh, 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 basically a compost that's incredibly fungal rich because, you know, obviously. The soil comes uh, generally from uh, just digging projects around the farm or if, if there's nothing like readily available, uh, we just go out into the field and wherever is open, we'll just scoop a little soil here, scoop a little soil there, wheelbarrow it up. And uh, we, you know, the piles are not extraordinarily large. So maybe if we're doing a couple hundred pounds of wheat bran, we'll wheelbarrow like four or five wheelbarrows of soil up to the pile. So, you know, it's not that much soil. You know, a little bit of an effort if there's nothing readily handy, but you know, nothing. They generally say, you know, there's lots of recommendations in Korean natural farming and things. But uh, again, you know, good for experimentation, but they generally say, you know, the, getting at least a little field soil into it is, is very useful because that is what you're trying to really adjust. It, so when you reintroduce this stuff into the field, it's already grown in the soil that it's gonna be introduced to. So, you know, that may be true. So generally we'll use at least 50% of the actual field soil as opposed to like something off the side of the field or something like that. And, uh, oh, this is a great example of, this is a tree uh, of sugar maple on one side of the house, which is in full sun, you know, relatively good growing area, a little sparse, the leaves, you know, because everything's struggling these days. And this is the tree that the culture is being produced under. So, and this tree did not look good before we started culturing under it. This one looked bad because we had dug a, a a drainage, no, uh, a water line right underneath the side of its roots and it really damaged its roots. So it was getting a, uh, you know, a damaged top, had some dieback on the top. And, you know, this is like a standard sugar maple. It's actually a good looking sugar maple for our farm these days. That one looks reasonable. But, you know, this is what, you know, you, and this is the way the trees all used to look. You couldn't see through them. You know, no, you can't see any sky through that tree. Uh, big leaves, see the coloration of the leaves. And so, uh, you know, it gives you this kind of thing is, you know, ugly as all that other stuff is with the tree dial and stuff, you know, this shows that we still have the capacity to have vibrant tree growth, you know? And so, uh, you know, it's just a matter of uh, getting there and making it important enough. Yeah, fish heads, we make our own fish fertilizer. Uh, which mostly just gets used because we don't really need a lot of nitrogen in the system. It mostly just gets used for uh, the greenhouse potting soil, actually. 
Uh, but Korean natural farming is chock full fish storage facility, separate from anything else, smells bad. <laughs> the Koreans, the translations are terrible. They would say something like, smell bad, you know? And so, yeah, there it is, separate, separate little fish storage area. All right, winter vegetables. Now I'm gonna run through this really quick. Uh, here is low tunnel culture. We use high tunnels too. We've got about an acre of low tunnels. We love low tunnels. Uh, they do not damage the soil nearly to the extent that the high tunnels seem to. Uh, it is because I think that they do not dehydrate the soil because they're so narrow. Uh, this is just in the old days, actually when we tilled, those are raised beds with a uh, mulch layer in between. Uh, this is setting hoops. First you lay down the bags, then you lay down the hoops. Obviously I'm really speeding through this. Uh, there's a double layer of plastic. The perforated layer is underneath a solid layer. Uh, they are all cut to eight foot sheets to cover a three foot bed. Uh, uh, lots and lots of them. We've been doing that for a long time. Storage in the sheds to keep them out of the sun. There's cloth row covers as well. But for this is uncovered. You can see how early this picture is. There's no vegetation whatsoever probably early March or something, and you know, there's that much vegetative growth already. We're waiting for a rain there or something. Uh, you know, extremely high yielding, at, there's carrots overwintered. Uh, very high yielding at a time of year where there is nothing else. And so it's very good for market to have this much material, particularly the highest yield period for it is really like starting at the end of February. Uh, and then March is just huge, April is huge, May is still just wailing away before any of the outdoor field stuff has even come close to coming into the growers. So when you've got accounts that you've been delivering salad greens and spinach and cilantro and parsley to for February, March, April, and May, and then other growers are gonna come in in June and try to sell the account, you know, you are so far down the road with those accounts and securing uh, year-round work and uh, year-round sales is very, very useful. The, excuse me, the, the layers of the plastic, mm -hmm. are they literally one on top of the other? Yeah, one right on top of the other. Let me see if I have a picture of it again. Let's see. Um, yeah, one right on top of each other, sandbagged. Basically, everything's broken into 40-foot lengths so that two people can work down a 40 foot length. So they're all the covers, everything's standardized. Every bed is the same size, every length is the same size, every cover is cut to the same size. So although this field is 100, this particular section may be 120 feet long, it's all divided into 40 foot sections so that two people can walk down and uncover or, or cover everything very, very uh, quickly and efficiently. Because this, you know, all requires a little bit of human effort. Um, well, in general, you know, we use a lot of diverse effort, uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, my family members uh, to interns from the university, lots of volunteers because such an interesting production system uh, and locals uh, to kind of take care of uh, a lot of labor too. And so it all works out, you know, if you added it all up, I would suspect that it takes about two full-time people for an acre of vegetables. So in other words, it would take about six people for, you know, full-time, if you added that kind of all up, uh, to operate uh, three acres in this intensive level of a production. Just as a rough guess. I mean, you could certainly get away with a little less than that, but it's important when it comes to like families looking at trying to get a farm going and stuff, uh, you know, uh, if it was just my family, we could certainly make do with an acre or two of vegetable production. And, you know, what every house in my town of Lebanon has two acres on it. It's a two acre zoning. Every single house could provide the livelihood for the family that lives there, as long as this land is reasonably decent. But, uh, yeah, you don't, you know, 
So it's really up to you. And again, like I said at the beginning of the talk, you know, that's the way it is in the whole world. You know, so much of the world is just little family farms, two to five acres. A five acre farm in China is huge. A five acre farm in Ghana is big. You know, Ghana, we had a guy volunteering from Ghana. He assured me, you know, every farm in Ghana, at least the vegetable, I mean, ranching is different or something, but uh, vegetables, everything, two to five acres, family units. Uh, they are a major pineapple exporter. All those pineapples come off of those two acre and five acre farms, all co coagulated through their, you know, traditional agricultural systems to be major exporter of pineapple. So, you know, in China's the same way. All those farms are just run by small, small operators and they're major exporters. So, you know, America, we haven't really figured out that, you know, the small scale nature of agriculture is certainly the way of the past and the way of the future. But uh, certainly, yeah, relatively low capital investment, low land base, uh, very intensified production. <clears throat> Let me keep rolling through these. Uh, you know, sandbags, obviously a little bit of effort required for all of this kind of thing, but uh, very rewarding work, you know, very productive. The, the, the hoop tunnels capture 35 degrees of heat gain on a sunny day. So it's 30 outside, it's 65 under there growing the crop. Uh, so production all winter long, you know, granted January is a little slow. Usually we can get heavy snows, that think, keep things covered and whatnot. Uh, and sometimes we'll have to get rid of the snow, you know, by knocking the top. Like we want to, if we want to speed things up, we'll knock the top of the cover off. Uh, just to, once sunlight can penetrate that, it's going to melt itself off. But just to get a little, you see how they're fully covered, uh, just to get a little sun into them, we'll knock them off. Uh, it would take two people, maybe about an hour or a little more to knock the tops off of an uh, acre of low tunnels. Not a tremendous effort. I mean, it's a little physical. It gets deep. You're wading through deep snow, but nothing, you know, that's cost prohibitive or anything like that. Uh, yeah, there's fully covered. There it is starting to melt out. There it is knocked off. And here's some examples. All right. So here's the tops all knocked off. And here it is a few days later. Uh, once the tops have been knocked off, you can see that the snow actually acts as an insulator and reflective material to continue the crop growth at even crop growth at even better rates. Here it is melting off even better. You know, snow actually works in your favor to a large degree in the winter by insulating and uh, reflecting. Uh, you know, if it, the plastics, you can always pull them out. Cloth row covers, you cannot work with in the winter in this kind of freezing conditions. But uh, you a question? That's all wire, half inch wire. Conduit is uh, too difficult to set in the ground quickly. So this is a quarter inch uh, wire hoop, which uh, is pretty thick. So it's just straight stock steel uh, cut into six foot eight lengths. Uh, and then we hand bend it. It's not too hard to hand bend. And we'll just cruise right through those. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, this is sawdust lit on fire. Uh, and so it's just starting to char there. I just threw a match right on top of that dry sawdust. It's on top of some plywood in the snow. And this is what it started to look like. You were churning it about to create a black char. And uh, we don't want it to turn to ash. Excited crew people. Yep. Uh, uh, so we're stirring it about and it's flaming, a little smoky, nothing too big though. And uh, let's see. I'll speed through these. Now we're shoveling it. We got wide bottom scoops and flat. We are dumping it into 55 gallon drums of water uh, where we have combined uh, sea salt primarily and a little molasses. If we need additional char, we could always add. We have humate or bone char or something like that. But making our own char, this is the basic formula, a blackened char material, uh, salt, sea salt, which we use as a fertilizer and molasses, which we use as a fertilizer. So three fertilizer materials that the field appreciates and we already use, uh, mixed in together the irrigation pump with a screen over it, sprayed out on top of the snow. 
uh, melts snow so fast that we can clear acres uh, or feet of snow off that acre in a matter of days in the sun. Yeah, that's snow melt formula in case we got a really, if we had like, we had that year where there's three or four feet of snow. I'm going to finish up quick here. I'm just going to run through it because there's only a few more slides. Harvest and storage. Uh, so we have various harvest knives. You got to have a grinder, keep everything sharp, protect your eyes. For the serrated weed knife or harvest knife, very small, I think it's like an eighth of an inch thick uh, chainsaw file to make those grooves in that. The files are cheap uh, for chainsaws, the smallest chainsaw file available, to file that thing out. Going out to the field, the baskets, you want efficiency, you know, cart or carrying four baskets. We use wood for almost everything. Uh, that's covered when we bring in baskets of vegetables. We cover them before processing. There we are carrying the baskets into the field. You can carry four at a time. This is harvesting. Uh, note, this is one-handed harvesting with, I am leaning on that bucket or basket and my elbow is on my knee. And that is how we can work for long periods of time bent over is because we always basically save our back by supporting our back through our positioning. Uh, the hand grab, this is hand harvesting small baby spinach. Uh, we don't grab a few leaves and toss them in the bucket. Uh, you need a hand activity where you're your thumb is gathering, as you're picking, your thumb is able to gather several handfuls and keep amassing them as you're bent over and then pitch into the bucket. So uh, uh, finger dexterity, uh, often whenever I'm working with anybody new, uh, dexterity and strength and agility, they're all important, but really the key to success with uh, speed and harvesting efficiency is uh, rap rapidity of decision making. The mind has to, you have to say, you have to decide what to do next. That is what slows people down. It is not a physical difficulty. It's how fast their mind can say that, 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 that. And then your hands can easily keep up with that. It's all about mind and uh, ability to, to make a fast decision. So when I'm cutting that, I no longer am looking at that. I am looking at the next place to place my knife. My hand, as I move the knife, has accumulated that uh, material, this is mosh, uh, into my thumb. In my next cutting, I'm amassing more material from the next cut. So it's all very, uh, it's decision or quick decision oriented harvesting. Uh, note again that my elbow, you can't see it here, but this is amassing. This is amassing. These are just cut after cut, amassing into my hand, like three or four cuts before I throw it into the, into the bushel basket. The whole time, my, el my elbow was on my knee as I was doing that to support my back. Here's a processing area, which you know, normally in the summer has a tent over the top of it, a large, long tent. Uh, simple tubs, processing table, screen tables to dry things on, root vegetable washer over there, able to back the truck in, load the trucks. Root cellars are handy in this direction. And so everything's centrally organized and very easy to move things around. Water's available. Root vegetable washer. When I bought one of these, the guy said to me, you know, it's expensive. It was like two or three thousand dollars. He said that, you know, which is a lot of days of laborers watch, washing root vegetables. But uh, when the guy said to me, he said, you're going to love this thing because of morale. And sure enough, when we put this thing on, to not be, you know, uh, uh, fishing through cold water in November, looking for a few turnips, and instead you're standing at the end of this thing, churning about and depositing washed turnips right in front of you. Great, granted, you got to sort them or whatever. Huge difference in uh, attitude towards turnips. Uh, truck delivery, root cellars, uh, great handy things to have. Uh, this one we specifically dug for a root cellar. There was another on the farm. Uh, when we got there, uh, very useful. I mean, we keep the worms in there in winter too, but uh, you know, for vegetables that you're bringing in, you know, root vegetables this time of year, just stacks and stacks, we stuff them full of vegetables 
and then sell them all off through the winter time. Uh, no power needed, high humidity, just great uh, uh, benefit to vegetable sales. This one is a smaller root cellar that we broke a hole in the side of the upper part of it, the concrete uh, blocks there, and installed a cool bot. So it functions as a root cellar in winter or our cooler in the summer. And there's just a bunch of boxes stacked up in one of the root cellars. A lot of wood, we use a lot of wood, uh, vegetables like wooden boxes as opposed to plastic. And, uh, and that's it. All right, so uh, thanks everybody. <laughs> I knew I was going to run out of time, you know. <laughs> okay, you've been great. Thanks for coming up. Yeah. Yeah.